And Ms. Singer, if you would please call the roll. Chairman Klein? Here. Mr. Lovell? Here. Mr. Knight? Here. Mr. Banks? Here. Secretary Brown? Here. Mr. Witte? Here. Mr. Bro? Here. Ms. Goodson? Here. Mr. Broussard? Mr. Wyatt? Here. Mr. Entz? Here. Ms. Gotro? Here. Mr. Burke? Here. Ms. Salings Gorman? Here. Mr. Elmers? Here. Mr. Bourgeois? Mr. Hidalgo? Here. Ms. Cormier? Here. Mr. Segrera? President McGinnis? Here. Representative Zerang? Senator Henskins? You have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Ms. Inger. Um, members, I'd ask that you just take a look at the agenda. The only change that I have to the agenda at this time is we do not have Brian Lazina for agenda item number uh, 10. Um, Mr. Lazina is, has been out. And so what we're going to do is move the Atchafalaya Basin fiscal year 2024 annual plan into the same agenda item um as the draft fiscal year 2024 annual plan so a chaffalaya plan will be folded into the same uh presentation that bren is going to give on the on the annual plan so i don't i don't think i need a motion uh to change that but um it's it's in order on the agenda but just just make note of that so do i have a motion to approve the agenda a motion must mr lovell second by mr hidalgo any public comment on the agenda any objection to the motion motion approved um approval of the minutes from our last meeting in saint tammany which inger circulated i got a motion by miss gorman a second by mr hidalgo any public comment on the minutes any objection to that motion motion approved um agenda item number five old business any old business or announcements this morning members do want to make uh one announcement that we are we are joined by this morning um by parish president uh, Keith Hinckley who was just recently elected as parish president of Plaquemines Parish and so President Hinckley we just wanted to welcome you to the CPRA board meeting very much look forward to to working with you sir and updating you on all the the great things that we have underway in Plaquemines Parish so thanks for for being here this morning uh, lastly, members, before we actually get into uh, Bryn's implementation update, you will recall at our last meeting in St. Tammany, I, I gave a kind of year in review presentation to the board to talk about the Im incredible progress that's been made over the last several years. And so while we focus on progress that has been made at the last meeting, this meeting is going to really focus on the opportunity that lies ahead for the state's coastal program. We have an un unprecedented opportunity in front of us. And so you're going to hear presentations today from Bryn and Stu on a new coastal master plan, a new 50 year long term plan for the overall sustainability of coastal Louisiana. There is a lot of issues that come before this board none are more important than the process we go through to update the master plan it is the plan that will govern the state's activities over the next six years and has a 50-year planning horizon it is the most important work that this board does you're also going to hear an update on the fiscal year 2024 annual plan a plan that again calls for unprecedented record-breaking investments in coastal restoration and hurricane protection projects you've heard us over the last several months talk about that fiscal year 2023 was the year of the dredge more investments in hurricane protection and coastal restoration than ever before with 1.3 billion dollars the annual plan that would be presented to the louisiana legislature this year or surpass last year's plan a record number of investments a record number of projects in construction and so members um, it should go without saying but the opportunity in front of us is one that we at CPRA plan to take full advantage of and so I hope all of you 
came back um, after the holidays with batteries recharged and uh, as we head into the final year uh, of this governor's uh, term and so I want to thank you for your support thank you for your involvement thank you for the work uh, and for the proponents and ambassadors you are for South Louisiana and with that I'm gonna turn it over to mr. Brent Haas he's gonna give us a CPRA implementation update mr. Haas Thank you chairman Klein members of the board as always it's uh, it is great to be here with you this morning um, we're gonna mix it up a little bit this morning with the implementation update as you've seen from the agenda and from uh, chairman Klein's comments we've got a, a pretty heavy uh, agenda as it relates to uh, the upcoming year the master plan annual plan and so forth and so while I am going to go through the implementation update I did um, want to take a little bit of time and kind of echo uh, some of chairman Klein's comments from uh, the November meeting and uh, go back through some of the accomplishments uh, from 2022. Uh, namely, uh, there are quite a few that actually occurred uh, after our November board meeting. So I want to update you on, on some of those as well. So um, as is typical, I, I certainly want to start off with letting you know that we've got a healthy slate uh, of projects uh, active at the current moment. We're still hovering around that 100 project or so number. 35 projects at construction, with 13 of those being uh, hurricane risk protection projects, risk reduction projects, excuse me, uh, 10 marsh creation projects. Those are projects like the NOV hurricane risk reduction project in Plaquemines Parish uh, and the North Lafourche Levee improvement projects that are being constructed uh, now. There are 57 projects in engineering and design. That includes projects like the Calcasieu Sabine large scale marsh creation hydrologic restoration projects and three projects in planning. That includes projects like the um, uh, St. Tammany risk reduction projects. So this is typically where I would transition to some, some specific projects and kind of give you some stats and locations and videos of those. And as I, as I mentioned, we're going we're gonna to thing, mix things up just a little bit. So those of you of a certain age uh, are familiar with David Letterman and his late night show. Uh, he was, uh, of course, famous for going through his top 10 list nightly. Um, we're going to do that with you here today and, and give you a top 10 from 2022. Um, I had considered in, in chatting with Chairman Klein, we might do uh, something else he was famous for, stupid human tricks. Uh, <laughs> HR advised that that would be a bad idea. So we'll stick with the top 10. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with uh, quite a, an eye-popping number here. Of course, one of the first big moments in 2022, as you all are aware, was the announcement of over $2.6 billion in funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and from the Disaster Supplemental Act. So these, pro these uh, funding sources um, uh, have funded uh, 21 projects, when we're speaking of the IJA um, funding sources, that include projects like Morganza of the Gulf, Southwest Coastal, and the Atchafalaya Basin. Uh, over $2 billion in funding has, will come to the state uh, as part of the Supplemental Disaster Relief Act. Those projects include things like the New Orleans to the Venice Hurricane Protection Project I just, just mentioned, West Shore Lake Pontchartrain Project, the Amit Basin Project, Co-Meat Diversion Projects being led by DOTD, um, SELA, or the Southeast Louisiana Flood Protection Projects, Upper Baratary Basin, Grand Island Vicinity, and the Tangipahoa Parish Risk Reduction Projects, just to name a few. Certainly not insignificant. Coming in at number nine, uh, I would say the Louisiana Coastal Area, Baratary Basin, uh, Shoreline Feasibility Study Projects. Many of you are familiar with the LCA program. Uh, it was a program we uh, entered into partnership with the Corps of Engineers in the early 2000s. Uh, one of the near-term large-scale projects associated with that was to restore all of the Baratary Basin Barrier Islands. And with the completion um, in the latter half of 2022 of the Kamenata Back Barrier uh, project that you see under construction in this video here, uh, we have effectively completed that LCA project and done work on every bear island or bear headland in the uh, Barataria Basin, not to mention the Terrebonne Basin uh, with which in which we've also done work on, on each of those islands as, as well. Coming in at number eight, we've talked a lot about this one, but the Spanish Pasture Ridge and Marsh Creation Project uh, is nearing completion. It's substantially completed construction in this past year uh, and should finish up this year. This is the largest ridge and marsh restoration project that we have ever built, as you've heard me say. And keeping along those themes uh, of the largest ever, uh, we completed the Terrebonne Basin Barrier Island projects uh, project back in July of last year. This is about almost a nine mile uh, reach of Barrier Islands that has been worked on. A little over a thousand acres of, uh, of these Barrier Islands were restored as, as part of that project completion. So uh, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's worth repeating. The largest ridge and marsh creation project ever uh, that we've ever constructed was under construction in this uh, past year. The lar largest Barrier Island project 
project that we've ever built uh, was completed last year and there are two other project types that are the biggest and, and baddest if you will uh, that we've been involved in uh, this year as well so the Lake Bourne Charlotte um, excuse me the Lake Bourne large-scale marsh creation project will be the biggest marsh creation project we've ever built ever built in the um, um, the uh, Biloxi Marsh Living Shorelines project is the largest one of those. So four of the sort of tools in our toolbox or categories of projects that we worked on uh, have all either been completed or started uh, and under construction in this past year and this year. Chairman Klein addressed this in November. I'll not spend a, a ton of time on it, but I think this uh, statement is, uh, is just as valid now as it was the was then word uh, uh, is after 2022 was was passed of course in this past year and is a significant uh, piece of legislation for the coastal Louisiana as there's ever been um, it has included uh, clarifying that the ecosystem restoration the MRGO uh, restoration will be hundred percent federally funded that's a huge win for the state of Louisiana it extends the deadline uh, from 2023 to 2032 for the third and final payment for the HISDRA system that we have talked about here before. It prioritizes coastal restoration as a main mission of the Corps by including provisions of the Shore Act uh, that was sponsored by um, uh, Senator Cassidy and Congressman Graves. We're thankful, of course, for that. It authorized Upper Barataria Basin Hurricane and Storm Damage Risk Reduction Project, about a $1.8 billion project in the parishes of St. Charles, St. John, St. James, Jefferson, Ascension, Lafouche, uh, and Assumption Parishes. It authorized the South Central Louisiana Hurricane Risk Reduction Risk Reduction Project uh, in the parishes of St. Mary, St. Martin, uh, and Iberia. And it declared that the Lower Mississippi River Comprehensive Study would be a fully federally funded project. So uh, and that's uh, among many other things. Those are just some of the highlights that were in word of, of 2022. Talked again a lot about those two words by you, Shane, over the last several years. We were able to cut the ribbon on that in 2022 with Governor Edwards, uh, members of the legislature, and members of the St. Mary Levy District. This project, of course, will reduce flooding in a six parish, er uh, six parish region in the central portion of the state, and something we're very glad to have on the ground. So one of the new things that I had alluded to earlier uh, is that a final EIS was released for the river reintroduction of the Maripaw Swamp Project. Um, and construction began on the West Shore Lake Pontchartrain uh, risk reduction project. So uh, neither, both of those are, are significant uh, accomplishments. Um, the final EIS uh, for mitigation for the West Shore project did, did identify the Marpaw River Reintroduction Project as uh, the tentatively selected plan for mitigation for that project. So this is a huge step, I think, in our coastal program, not just in advancing these two important projects, but in integrating a restoration project with a risk reduction project that are adjacent to each other, that share features, and that will help benefit uh, each other. So this is a no-brainer. Of course, this is a big agenda item on today's uh, on today's uh, agenda, but um, we did release the draft 2023 Coastal Master Plan. Of course, the plan that sets the vision for our coastal program, as Chairman Klein alluded to earlier. Uh, this was actually done just in the first week of, of this year, but I'm going to count it as a 2022 accomplishment because most of the heavy lifting to get it to, uh, to January 6th was done uh, in the years prior, of course. A uh, record of decision was also received for the mid bear Terry sediment diversion. Um, and so this was, a, again, another big step in receiving the permits that uh, and a decision from the Corps that the project is in the overall public interest and uh, paves the way for the advancement of that project. And coming in, certainly uh, last but not least, um, is the turnover of the hurricane and storm damage risk reduction system uh, that occurred in May with representatives of the Corps of Engineers, the local levy districts, the flood protection authorities, um, Chairman Klein, and many, many others. So uh, this system has, of course, uh, performed quite well, uh, it being substantially complete with the exception of some mitigation features associated with it uh, is a big load off of many folks' minds, certainly in the greater New Orleans area, uh, and it performed quite well last year. Uh, during Hurricane Ida. So I appreciate you indulging me in that. I know it was quick, but uh, upon some reflection over the holidays, I thought it was worth uh, um, mentioning some of those things again, and I wanted to touch on a few of the new things as well. So just this, uh, this last month, uh, we've talked a, a good bit with you all about developing a workforce uh, and the technical skills and so forth to support the coastal program that we have built and continue to build. So we were able to uh, continue that effort uh, with the Louisiana Workforce Commission, uh, the Coastal Technical Assistance Center, some of our partners through the QIPA program, the Department of Corrections, 
uh, coast builders and some of the uh, some representatives from Louisiana's technical and community colleges as well were able to take a trip to see one of our projects. This is a New Orleans land land bridge project and discuss um, uh, sort of how these projects get built, what kind of labor is needed, what sort of skill sets are needed uh, to assist these entities in helping prepare Louisiana citizens for Louisiana work uh, into the future. Last week, the Governor's Advisory Commission reconvened after a couple of years of, of a hiatus uh, during the, the COVID years, uh, but want to certainly recognize one of your fellow board members, uh, Ms. Karen Gotro, as the new chair uh, of that commission, and Ms. Simone Malaz as the uh, vice chair. So it was good, I think, to get that group uh, kicked off again and engaged. It was, a, it was a lively discussion, I think a good discussion, a good meeting, and looking forward to, to good things coming out uh, of the commission into the future. And I think lastly, um, uh, we're all, uh, you all hopefully are aware of the State of the Coast Conference that will be coming up at the end of May, the beginning of June. Uh, the deadline to submit proposals for that, uh, that conference has been uh, extended to January 31st. So we've got another couple of weeks uh, to get comments in or proposals in, uh, I should say, for that conference. Uh, information about the conference and those proposals can be submitted at www.stateofthecoast.org. <clears throat> and I do have a couple other slides, forgive me, but uh, this is a, a change in date. Uh, originally, the Quipper Task Force meeting was scheduled to be tomorrow. That's been uh, pushed back to January 26th, next Thursday uh, at 9.30 a.m. It'll be at the Corps of Engineers headquarters um, in New Orleans on Leak Avenue. Um, and just another announcement as well, there's a Quipra Wetlands Riding Contest for this year. Um, the entries will be accepted through March 1st of this year. You can scan the QR code here or go to uh, or ask questions at the email address you see listed at the bottom of the page here. So I wanted to mention that. This is done in honor and in memory of Je uh, Jennifer Ritter uh, Guidry, who passed away uh, untimely uh, just a couple of years ago. So, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, that concludes my my. Uh, um, uh, perhaps unusual uh, implementation update. Happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you, Bryn. Uh, members, I don't see, never mind, spoke too soon. Representative Zerain. Just a quick one. Now that the hurricane storm damage risk reduction system has been turned over, are there any plans or need for uh, elevating sections? I know there's consideration going to 200 year level. Are there any deficiencies that are going to need to be addressed? Yeah, I would, I would say there, there are no um, uh, significant deficiencies, but as with any system, you know, the maintenance is needed uh, periodically. And so uh, the flood protection authorities and the levy districts, are, as well as CPR, of course, are keeping up with that. You did mention the 200-year level of protection. That's something I didn't mention that was actually authorized in order of 2022 to investigate uh, potentially increasing that level of protection for the system. So we have engaged uh, with the core sort of uh, preliminarily, I would say, on, on how that's going to happen and, and what sort of will need to take place to make that happen. I don't have a lot of details on that right now, but certainly happy to follow up with you on that. Nor, nor is there funding. So as you know, Representative right. Zerang word is just an authorization, but there's right. no funding tied to it either at this point in time. So the, the authorization is now there, as Brent said, but no, <clears throat> no funding from the Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Zerang. Uh, Ms. Gotro. Yeah, thank you for that presentation, Brandon. As mentioned at the commission, it's incredible about the, the amount that's been accomplished and um, what we have to look forward to. I'm personally very excited about the Lower Mississippi River Feasibility Study being 100% federal because I know we were all concerned about what a, even though Mississippi probably would have been our main partner, I think it's it's great that hopefully we can move forward in a more expedited manner with that. Hopefully we get the money along with the authorization. So, that's right. Thank yep. you. All right, thank you, Ms. Gotro. Any other questions for Bryn on the implementation update? Okay, looks like the board is clear, uh, Bryn. And so we're going to move on to agenda item number seven. Uh, we're going to hear an update on the Conservation and Restoration Partnership Award announcements from Kent and Jessica. We decided to move Kent up to the beginning of the agenda. He's usually our caboose. Uh, we thought I'd give him a, a prime time spot here this morning, but um, Ken and Jessica are going to be announcing the, the recipients for the Restoration Partnership Awards, uh, a program that continues to be very popular with stakeholders and interest groups across uh, South Louisiana. So, Ken and Jessica, good morning, and I'll turn it over to you. 
Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It feels weird to say good morning. It's usually good afternoon, uh, <laughs> uh, members of the board. Uh, so we're going to do a, a brief uh, program summary of the uh, partnership fund and then announce the uh, FY23 um, awards that um, that we recently uh, that we recently got to. So uh, I also have Jessica Converse here. Um, I'm going to introduce her to the board. Um, she is helping me uh, administer this program as well as a lot of other things uh, in our section. But um, she may be doing some of these announcements in the future or um, rolling out awards and that kind of stuff. So I wanted to introduce her. Um, I'd be remiss to not mention uh, another person who helps out, Brandon Champagne. Uh, he also does this work, and he might be at a future board meeting. So anyway, just a, a brief introduction. So Jessica recently did a, a program overview and sort of a, a pitch for future uh, partnership fund awards at the uh, Restore America's Estuaries Conference. And so I'm going to actually have her do the program overview, and then I'll do the awards summary. So Jessica. Good morning, y'all. Um, it's nice to be with you in person. I also wanted to second my congratulations to you, Ms. Gotro, on your position. Um, all right. Well, so as Kent said, I'm Jessica Converse. I work in the feasibility section in planning and research. Um, and I'm going to go over a program or overview of this small but mighty grant program that we offer. Um, since 2008, CPRA has offered uh, $1 million every year that it's available to our restoration professional partners across the coast, um, in tribal nations, in our NGO partners, in the parish, and um, in our private um, and private entities. Excuse me, I'm a little nervous, but um, this we have over 15 years, we've offered $12.6 million in state surplus funding, which has been matched with our partner contributions of $16.8 million. And this has totaled um, almost $30 million of additional conservation and restoration funds um, on the ground here in Louisiana. Oh, and pictured here is a Nature Conservancy project. Um, we have offered them an award through two partnership fund cycles, and they've constructed 1.5 uh, miles of shoreline protection using nature-based solutions as um, oyster reefs. So in 15 years, 42 partner projects have accomplished quite a lot. Um, 294,000 linear feet of terracing, 94 acres of recreational and ec educational space for all generations, um, nearly 600 acres of, oh, excuse me, 600 acres of swamp and coastal forest plantings. They've built 127 acres of marsh, have restored hydrologic channels and pump stations, and have protected miles of shoreline. Last but certainly not least are the thousands of people that have been involved, um, volunteering their time and their muscle to bring these projects to fruition. Uh, pictured here are Chalmette High School students that volunteered with the Pontchartrain Conservancy last year um, to restore ridge habitat in St. Bernard Parish. Our partner projects undoubtedly make um, an impact on the landscape as well as the people who live and serve their communities. And I'd like to highlight one project, which I'm sure you'll hear more from soon, but that is the Sankofa Wetland Park. Uh, this wetland park is located in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Um, it provides numerous ecosystem services, including stormwater retention, flood surge protection. It serves as an educational green space for students and residents, and to top it all off is a huge biodiversity hotspot, um, allowing um, our species endemic to our region to flourish. So the next slide is 17, our 17 of our partners. Um, I with the exception of Common Ground Relief, who will be participating in the Partnership Fund next year. Um, and they are the reason that these projects are so successful, and we look forward to working with many more in the future. So with that, back to you, Kent. All right, thank you, Jessica. Um, no need to be nervous. Uh, so. Uh, all right, so getting back to the awards announcement, uh, just as a reminder, we had uh, $1 million of surplus funding to allocate uh, in this program for uh, you know, projects that wanted to match with, the, with those funds. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, this is to 
further leverage, you know, uh, not just states funding, but then our partners funding get to leverage our funding. It's, it's a, it's a great, um, you know, it's a great, uh, well, for lack of a better term, great partnership. Um, so, uh, here's a reminder of the timeline. We announced in June that we were going to be, uh, at, um, doing this, doing this program this year. Uh, we had 17 proposals by 12 groups, um, and that, uh, we received those by October. And then we evaluated over the next couple months uh, through December, and we started doing some preliminary notifications and um, and discussions about um, the various awards uh, in December. So um, you know we're now working towards finalizing those agreements, and um, you know obviously into implementation in the future. Uh, just as a reminder, the proposals uh, are evaluated on these five criteria: consistency with the goals and objectives of the master plan. You know the uh, the footprints and the the amount of uh, of conservation and, and restoration synergy with other efforts. Uh, certainly, we want projects that are constructible, and then of course, you know, how much match the partners are bringing to the table. All right, so here's a here's a table breakdown of our awards. You've got the partner and project name on the left. The award is in the center column, and then the partner match is in the right column. Um, we often like to linger on this so everybody can kind of. Uh, chew on each one of these awards, but I'll, I'll read I'll read just the partner and project name real quick. So we have Apache Minerals LLC. They're going to do uh, a ridge and marsh enhancement and refurbishment. We have the Coalition to Restore, Co Restore Coastal Louisiana. And they're actually uh, administering this this match and this grant uh, on behalf of several other NGOs and uh, and folks in that area. So there's going to be I think well there's at least a handful of NGOs that are actually going to be getting involved in this uh, large effort. Uh, Vermilion Parish uh, is going to be doing a hydrologic enhancement uh, near South Pecan Island. Um, and then uh, St. John the Baptist is going to be doing a wetland restoration near their Sunset Park. Ducks Unlimited will be doing a bank line restoration in Caracro Bayou. And St. Kofa Community Development Corporation will be uh, further enhancing uh, a larger portion of their uh, wetland park. This is what it looks like across the coast. We've rarely had such a good distribution from uh, from east to west. We've got uh, uh, the, Hyd the Vermilion Hydro Project, obviously in Vermilion Parish. The Ducks Unlimited projects in Terrebonne Parish. Apache is doing uh, their project in Lafouche. We've got Saint Kofa in Orleans Parish. The, uh, the the collective run by CRCL is going to be in uh, Saint Bernard, and then the Saint John. Sunset Park is obviously in St. John the Baptist Parish. So it's a great representation, great spread across the coast. Um, <clears throat> so here's what we expect to get out of our, uh, out of our uh, awards this year. Here are the outcomes. I just mentioned we've got restoration in six parishes. This is the first time we've been able to distribute across uh, such a, a wide uh, geographic extent. Uh, we uh, are again partnering with parishes. Uh, it's been a couple of years since we've had a parish partner and uh, we're, we're glad to start partnering with parishes. Uh, that was a that was a that was a nice surprise this year. Um, we do have one private entity and three NGO partners, and then of course one of those NGOs is acting on behalf of several other NGOs, and we'll be um, you know getting a lot of effort on the ground um, uh, through that match. Uh, we have two projects that are directly supporting recreation, so that's leveraging our you know, restoration funding for uh, another of our, our of our priorities in terms of uh, you know recreating in our in our wetlands, and then we have uh, three hydrologic projects that are going to be benefiting a very large area. And it's actually hard to quantify and showcase, but uh, those are going to be you know, enhancing very large sw uh, swaths of marsh uh, in our coast. So here's some you know tangible numbers to chew on. Uh, we're expecting well over 30,000 uh, plants to go in the ground, uh, even some uh, acreage of uh, SAV habitat, uh, submerged, aquatic, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, we expect 32, uh, thir up to 32 acres of swamp to be enhanced through another project with more uh, swamp species and, uh, planted, 9,600 feet of, of terraces, and 1.5 acres of swamp and 600 acre, uh, sorry, 600 feet of shoreline protection. Um, and I mentioned those hydrologic uh, uh, restorations as well, and um, you know they they do benefit a large uh, amount of acreage in those regions. So I'm going to end there, uh, but I do want to uh, just kind of point out this is a great shot. I was digging through our archives of our, uh, of our projects. And uh, in the background, you can see some terraces being built, but then you can see some of our partners, uh, you know, on site kind of looking over plans and specs and um, just kind of, uh, you know, it's a great representation of not just the project going on the ground, but the people behind the organizations making uh, these projects happen. So um, 
with that, you know, uh, we'll take any questions. And uh, all right, thank you, Kent and Jessica. We need questions on restoration partnership awards. Ms. Gotro. Not so much as a, qu a question as I'd like to um, express my excitement over the slate of projects that you have proposed this year. Jessica, I think you did a great job with that presentation. Can't always appreciate your presence. And I do remember, I think we see such good impacts from them. Um, I do remember a couple of years when the cupboard was a little bare. We couldn't do it, but I think the benefits from this program are, are very impressive. So thank you for bringing this to us today. Yep, certainly. Thank you. Yep, and I would say there have been conversations about actually plussing up the, the cupboard, so to speak, on, on this program. Uh, there's, there's a lot of submissions, a lot of interest, and I know a lot of time at the board level we, we talk about projects that are thousands of acres of marsh, hundreds of millions of dollars, but there's a lot of important projects that are smaller in scale that I think are worth our attention as well. And that this program gives us the opportunity to partner with entities across the coast to, to implement those. Uh, Ms. Cormier for a question or comment. Yeah, it's pretty much a comment. Jessica, great job. Kent, thank you for that presentation. Um, I think uh, uh, piggybacking on what Chairman Klein just said, I think it's important not only for the award amount and the match amount is to understand the people that are involved and the young people that for generations are going to love Louisiana and hopefully go into maybe fields and encourage them to work on coastal Louisiana for out throughout our um, next couple of generations. I personally went down and did some beach planning at, with CRCL and met people from all over the country, which surprised me to know that someone from New York comes down to plant beach grass in Cameron Parish because of all the storms that would hit. And that they deemed that something they could do to help us down here with all the uh, hurricanes that we've had in the past couple of years. So it's never underestimate the power of not just what we're building and not just the money that's spent, but also the people that are involved. So thank y'all for what you do. I think this is a great program. I love the fact that the partnerships are all working together, but the people that are involved in it too, that love Louisiana, love our culture, love our way of life, and hopefully for generations when all of us are not here, um, this will be carried on. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, thank you, and well said. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Cormier. All right, looks like the board is clear, guys. Thank you very much. Great update. <clears throat> All right, members. Undivided attention. Now that you haven't been paying attention thus far. But um, we're, we're going to get into it here on agenda item number number eight. And so I'm going to ask uh, Stuart Brown and uh, Bryn Haas to come back to the table to give us a presentation on the draft 2023 uh, coastal master plan. I know Bryn's going to make some opening comments, uh, members, but as I said in my opening statements, this is the most important thing that comes before this board it is this plan right here. And we are now in a public comment period on the draft 2023 coastal master plan. That comment period opened on January 6th. It will close on March the 25th. And so this is this board's opportunity. It is the public's opportunity to weigh in and express their concerns, put their comments on the record and to have full visibility on what's being planned across South Louisiana. There are still stakeholder groups, there are still interest groups, there are still people that live in this state that today are coming to meetings across South Louisiana and saying, I had no idea that this project was in the master plan. And they're referring to a project that has been in the plan since 2012. Okay that we are now moving through engineering and design. And so I don't want to get into a situation on this plan. I'm, we're going to do a series of public meetings. There's, going to, there's already been a series of community conversations that Brent and his team have done across South Louisiana to get ideas, to get concepts, to figure out what's important um, in particular regions across South Louisiana. 
But this period between January 6th and March the 25th, this is the formal process where you put your concerns or your comments on the record for us to consider. And so there's a public comment period at the end of this meeting. If you want to make a comment on the master plan, if you want to make a comment on the annual plan, we will take those comments as formal comments for both plans. Okay. Uh, and so we are going to be, uh, after this board meeting, we're going to start our, our public meetings here in Baton Rouge on January the 31st. We'll be in New Orleans on February I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Baton Rouge, January 31st. Homa, February 2nd. New Orleans, February 7th. And Lake Charles on February 16th. I will remind the board that going back to 2012, there have been several changes in the master plan between draft and final. So what you see presented today is the most important word that you're going to hear is draft. There have been changes made in 2012 and 2017 and there will be changes made in this plan based upon the public comment and public feedback that that we receive um and so i know brent is going to do this and i'm not going to steal his thunder but there's been an incredible amount of work to get us to this day when the 2017 plan was approved Stu and his team went to work on the 2023 plan. And so th this is a, a constant churn for us at CPRA. And um, I'll leave it at that because I know Bryn's going to give some shout outs here shortly. But um, Bryn, I, I just want to thank you and Greg for your leadership, Stu, for, for you leading this, this whole effort. Um, we've got a long way to go. Public comment periods are, are, can sometimes be difficult but they're also productive and they yield results and that's why we have enjoyed the broad bipartisan overwhelming uh, support from multiple stakeholder groups multiple interest groups because we give them the opportunity to let their voice be heard so Bren, i'll turn it over to you great and thanks again uh, mr chairman for that introduction appreciate it i i will tell you uh, Stu's going to do the heavy lifting on this presentation but i did want to want to say a few things uh just leading into it so uh i would certainly uh, second the chair's comments on on the team uh including Stu and and many of the folks uh that are here in the audience today sitting behind us but there's a there's a core group of about 10 or 12 folks at uh, cpra that uh that literally have spent uh every waking hour, uh, nearly every waking hour, I guess I should say, over the last six years, uh, getting us to where we are today. Um, and I want to want to thank those folks. Uh, many of them are, are in the room here today. In addition to them, of course, there have been uh, literally hundreds of others that have supported this effort. Uh, some of you uh, on the board have participated as part of the uh, uh, Coastal Advisory Team. Uh, we've had a lot of assistance from some of you and some of the folks that are in the audience today as it relates to community conversations and other outreach um, activities and, and, quite frankly, ideas about how we present some of this information. So uh, the list is too long to, to run through, but just know uh, for those that have been involved in getting us here today, we're, we're grateful uh, and want to thank you for that. I hope you all um, have had a chance to at least thumb through this document. Uh, it's something we're very proud of. Um, Stu will run through some of the differences, obviously, between 2017 and 2023 plan. Uh, and talk about obviously the content of what's in the in this plan here but I, I will tell you that I hope in, in thumbing through it that you've recognized that this is um, I think a particularly just it's a it's a beautiful document it's good to look at um, I think it is probably as readable uh, draft plan as we have had uh, to date I would also argue that the team has done an excellent job at getting us to a, a, a more well-developed draft plan probably than we've ever had in our master planning process. So in terms of kind of where we are at this stage with the draft, I think we are um, uh, we're, we're well ahead of where we have been in the past, and hopefully that bodes well uh, as we move into the public comment period and, and our public meetings and getting to the, the legislature and such. such. I think just at, at its very high level, I also just want to uh, make sure that you all are aware that, um, you know, what this project can, what this project, what these projects and this master plan can deliver uh, mean literally hundreds of square miles of our coastal wetlands. 
uh, that we wouldn't otherwise have without implementing the projects. And we have seen the benefits uh, of that um, from our past master planning efforts, right? Um, in addition to that, I think it, it uh, uh, is extremely significant to note that if you if you dig into the, the details here, that implementing this plan over a 50-year period could actually mean that coastwide, our risk from associated with hurricane uh, and storm damage, uh, tropical storms and so forth, could actually be lower than that that we experience today. Um, so I want to repeat that. That's a significant uh, accomplishment of the coastal program. If we implement the projects that are in this plan, uh, the risk that our communities across the coast experience um, uh, in 50 years could be less, actually less than it is that they experience here today. So um, a lot of potential uh, in this in this master plan. I'm going to be quiet now and let Stu get into his presentation, but uh, those were just a couple of points I wanted to make leading us into the, to the details of the plan. So Stu, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bryn. Um, so this presentation is intended to be an overview of the uh, of the master plan. Um, and uh, thank you to Chip and Bryn for doing the bragging for me. But one thing I'll encourage you uh, uh, at multiple points through this presentation is for you to really take time and, and uh, go through the plan itself. Uh, as Bryn mentioned, I think this is uh, certainly one of the more uh, accessible plans. And, and our team did a, a, an excellent job of, of uh, organizing and, and writing the plan in a way that I that I hope you all can uh, uh, enjoy and, and engage with and, and uh, uh, just encourage you to, to please take some time to, to explore the plan. So uh, I know all of you on the board are, are well aware of this and, and probably everybody in the audience too, but I think it's important to provide some context to what we're going to be talking about. So. Uh, Louisiana has been experiencing a land loss crisis for the last century. We've lost nearly 2,000 square miles of coastal wetlands since 1932. There are many causes for this land loss. Some of this uh, land loss is the result of natural processes, things we would expect to see in this sort of system. But a lot of it has been uh, induced or at least exacerbated by uh, human activity. And the loss is, of course, significant. Uh, in how it affects the landscape and, and how it affects habitats and affects the, the industries that rely on those fisheries and wildlife resources. Uh, it also impacts the industries like agriculture and navigation and, and oil and gas activities in the coastal zone. And as a result, uh, it affects all the folks who make their living on, on off of those industries or in associated industries, which, uh, as you all know, is a, a large portion of, of our, our uh, population in the coastal zone. And of course, land loss also increases the flooding impacts of hurricanes and tropical storms that affect nearly all coastal communities and citizens. As we see more open water, less land, deeper open water, the impacts of tropical storms and hurricanes, uh, the, the storm surge that's produced by those storms is, is greater, and we've seen the impacts of this uh, many times uh, over the last uh, uh, few decades. And the master plan is, again, the guiding document on how we meet these challenges. So what is the master plan? Uh, at its core, it is a prioritization effort. How can the state spend its money most cost effectively over the next 50 years to reduce storm surge based flood risk and build and maintain coastal wetlands? Um, importantly, uh, it is not a program or a funding source. It identifies where the state should invest as money becomes available through a wide range of, of, uh, of potential funding sources. Uh, and as money becomes available, those projects move into feasibility studies, engineering and design, and ultimately construction, a lot of the projects that, that Bryn went over um, uh, earlier in the, the implementation update and, and projects that Bryn will go over uh, in a few minutes in the annual plan uh, are projects that have been funded and moved into those various stages of, of project development and implementation. Uh, we then, of course, uh, maintain and monitor those projects, and everything that we learn from that process feeds back into how we evaluate these projects uh, through a master plan process and how we design and, and implement these projects. The plan is developed through a process that ensures adaptive management. Of course, we're required to update this plan every six years. This gives us an opportunity to reevaluate uh, the information that we have available, incorporate the best available uh, science, and it allows us to uh, reevaluate some of the processes and tools that we're using and make the appropriate updates 
uh, to those uh, processes and, and tools. The plan is built on world-class science and engineering. It advances a comprehensive and integrated approach to restoration and risk reduction. It incorporates extensive public input and review. And one of the, the bullet points that we're, we're uh, trying to stress in, in this master plan is that uh, the tools that we're, we're using can help illustrate how people and communities will experience a changing coast and allow for preparation and adaptation into the future. So we know the coast is gonna look very different 30, 50 years from now than it does today. Uh, we also know that the project of having a resilient coast is much bigger than just the, the restoration and risk reduction projects that CPRA does, though that is a, a, a big component. Uh, the, uh, having a resilient coast will be the result of, of uh, countless decisions from individuals, communities, local governments, businesses, or all levels of, of government uh, and we want to make sure that, that uh, we have information that can help people understand uh, the changing coast and, and help them make the best decisions uh, they can. So what is at stake is our homes, our jobs, and our culture. The, the goal, again, is to have a resilient coast, one in which people can continue to live and work and take advantage of all the things that make coastal Louisiana so economically, ecologically, and culturally important. So uh, going forward, uh, well, the, the public comment period, is, as Chip mentioned, is open through March 25th. Uh, we're meeting with you all today. We'll have four public hearings, and I've got a slide at the end uh, showing the, the locations and times uh, for those specific uh, public hearings. Um, based on the feedback we have through that, that, um, that public comment period, including at those public hearings, uh, we will develop a revised plan and we'll be presenting that to you all on April 19th uh, for your approval. Uh, and then the, the final draft uh, will be uh, uh, delivered to the legislature uh, following that approval. Ms. Cormier, do you have a question right now? No, or No, no okay. Light, <laughs> okay, your light was still blinking, so. All right. All right, so uh, here we're going to give a general overview to the process by which we identify and select projects to be included in the master plan. Uh, this figure is very complicated. It is in the master plan. It's figure 1-1. One, one. I encourage you to, to maybe spend some time with it uh, 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 as you're, you're leafing through the plan. But the important part here uh, is kind of the general uh, conceptual model of how we select projects. We begin with a suite of candidate projects. We model those projects. And then we prioritize the projects that give us the greatest uh, benefit. Um, so uh, from the top, we start with a suite of candidate projects. These come from a wide range of sources. This includes mining past master plans. This includes a public solicitation process. And for this master plan, we also developed regional work groups to help both develop new project ideas, but also uh, help us look at some of the concepts that have been around for, for a while and see if there's ways we can improve those. And also to help uh, uh, look at some of the, the concepts that came in through the public solicitation to see if there are ways that those can be improved or in some cases we have multiple projects and trying to address the same area or the same uh, issue and, and can we come up with a, a project that, that represents all of those to, to be evaluated through this process. Next we model those projects. Um, so we use numerical models to understand how the landscape is going to change, how changing landscape, how the changing landscape impacts storm surge, uh, and the future damages that will be caused by that storm surge. And so we model these projects to understand how they'll perform over time under a range of future environmental conditions, and we compare those to a baseline in which we don't implement the project. So we're interested over the next 50 years, how does this project perform compared to a future in which we don't implement that project? And the final step is prioritization. So the planning tool is really a, a optimization equation. Um, and the models give us the, the benefits or impacts of the projects, and the planning tool is where we select the suite of projects that gives us the greatest impact in terms of building and maintaining coastal wetlands and reducing storm surge-based flood risk. All right, so uh, in this section, we're going to discuss what's different uh, from this plan 
uh, or in this plan from the, the 2017 plan. We're just going to cover a handful of examples. Uh, this is something that's, that's well documented in the plan. Again, I'd like to point you towards, uh, towards taking a, a look at the plan. We also have quite a bit of, of supporting information uh, available on our website. Um, we're back to this confusing diagram once again because I want to point out that the starting point for uh, this master plan, for any master plan, is the work that we've done in the past. We're building off of the tools and processes that we've developed in the past uh, and making improvements uh, where is needed, largely based on feedback that we've gotten through the 2017 process and following that, uh, that plan uh, about uh, how we can, we can do better. Um, so one of the areas of improvement is in including the best available data, the best available science. And so we uh, uh, rely, we are, we are modeling a highly dynamic system. We rely on uh, uh, having the most up-to-date input data. Some areas of, of improvement since the 2017 plan, we have a new storm suite. Uh, uh, this is developed by the Army Corps uh, in, in uh, in short, it allows us to better understand current and future flood risk or, or, or uh, flood impacts better than we had in the past. Uh, another significant advancement for this plan is in the, uh, our understanding of what assets, uh, different characteristics of assets, where they are um, on the landscape. And so the storm surge modeling tells us what flood levels uh, could be. The asset database tells us what is damaged by those, those flood levels. And there have been significant advancements in, in those data sets over the last uh, uh, several years, including work that, that we've um, uh, done through this planning process. So, so those are just a few examples of improvements to the input data. Um, this is another uh, area that is, is documented in great, great detail on our website. And if I were to go into detail here, we would be here for, for uh, way too long. But this is an opportunity to uh, tout the uh, coastwide reference monitoring system. So the uh, CRIMS data set is now, uh, at the time that we're building these models, 10, 12, 15 years old, as opposed to five, seven years old during the last master plan development. Having that robust data set has allowed us to reevaluate a lot of the assumptions that we had made based on best professional judgment, based on, uh, 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 based on the literature, uh, and really uh, incorporate what we're actually seeing through this, this data set on the coast into our modeling process. Uh, and that is, is something that if you're interested in, we'll be happy to point you to uh, many, many pages and many, many hours of recorded presentations we put up on our, our website. Um, and another area that, that we've seen uh, significant improvements uh, is in our understanding of environmental drivers. And so when we're talking about environmental drivers, these include climate-related drivers like temperature and sea level rise, and also things like subsidence, which is not, of course, tied to uh, climate change. Uh, despite these advancements, there remains a, a fair amount of uncertainty in future conditions. Uh, because of this known uncertainty, we take a scenario approach. So if you've leafed through the plan, if you're familiar with past master plans, uh, in this master plan, we, we use two scenarios, a higher and a lower scenario. Uh, and we talk about the outcomes uh, based on those scenarios, and we'll, we'll go through some of those uh, in a moment. Um, these are not meant to be precise predictions, nor are they meant to represent a full range of possible outcomes. These scenarios were selected for this project evaluation process. And so we have a higher scenario, something that is uh, less likely, but would be extremely consequential if it were uh, to, to uh, come to fruition, and is something that is important for us to understand in the context of how these projects perform. Uh, we also have a lower scenario that is more within the range of uh, what the current state of the science suggests are, are more likely outcomes. And our goal is to select projects that will perform well, whether we realize that more severe future environmental scenario or whether we realize a, a more moder moderate, whether we realize more moderate future environmental conditions. So, Stu, can you say that again? I, I just, you know, there's a lot of, I know we're only doing two scenarios, but the, the high scenario is a scenario that scares the hell out of people, right? it's the most extreme that is that's what we're planning for that's how we're building projects up against that scenario but the more realistic scenario that what the science is actually projecting is more of the low scenario 
Yeah, the, the higher scenario is possible. It is something that we want to understand how these projects would perform if we were to realize that future scenario. Uh, but certainly the, the lower scenario, when we're talking, uh, I guess in this case, more about the, the uh, projected sea level rise, which is one of the primary drivers of land change uh, in our modeling, uh, that is more within the range of what is uh, uh, likely to be uh, seen. And so on the implementation side, when you're building a marsh creation project, when you're building a barrier island, when you're building a ridge, whatever the restoration project may be, you're building up against that highest scenario. And if that does not happen, it's possible, then you have a more sustainable project. Yes, that's true. And and uh, how these are used in the actual design and implementation of, of projects uh, is I, in, in most cases a case-by-case -case decision, and it's about risk aversion. Uh, we, when we build a, a structural protection project, we probably want to design uh, kind of uh, towards one of the higher scenarios. If we're building a terrace field where the consequences of, of uh, maybe underestimating the elevation to which we need to build that, the consequences are lower. And so uh, this, is, this is all an exercise in, in risk reversion. Uh, but understanding the, the range of possible outcomes uh, was the goal of this, this program. We'll talk about one of the kind of process improvements to make sure that rather than just selecting projects based on one scenario and hoping uh, for a better outcome, we can select projects that will be effective whether we realize a, a more severe future condition or a more moderate future condition. Okay, thank you. So in addition to the sort of uh, uh, data and science-based technical improvements, we also have improvements in the process. And I, I touched on this uh, a bit earlier, but a lot of this is based on feedback we got through the 2017 plan and, and in the, the uh, months or so following that plan as we were uh, developing the process for the, the 2023 plan. And a lot of what we heard was uh, that that you all need to take more of a regional approach. The issues in the Schneer Plain are not the issues in Terrebonne, are not the issues in the North Shore, and the solutions on the North Shore are not the same as Terrebonne, are not the same as, as uh, the Schneer Plain. And so uh, one of the, this is of course true, uh, and, and one of the steps we took to, to help come up with a more regionally focused plan is we developed regional work groups. A handful of the folks on the board have participated in these. I know uh, I've seen quite a few folks in the, the audience who've, who've uh, participated in those work groups. And these were really um, uh, a, a venue for uh, folks to, uh, one, think about project ideas. Again, those, those uh, issues in the Schneer Plain are different. Let's think about solutions to those issues in terms of the projects that we can, we can uh, uh, model for this plan. Uh, but they also served as a venue to communicate throughout the process and to um, uh, keep folks updated on the work we're doing and get feedback uh, on, again, the sort of issues and, and uh, uh, that, that those uh, areas experience. And if you open up the plan, you'll see about a quarter or a third of the document is dedicated to this, uh, this, uh, these regional sections where we take those, the five regions that, that uh, uh, we use and we talk about them in, in uh, more detail and, and provide some kind of uh, specific storylines. A lot of those are guided by the discussions we had with the, the regional work group about, again, what's important to these regions, what's important that the master plan uh, represents or addresses uh, related to uh, uh, those specific regional uh, issues. Another project uh, or process improvement is the development of a new risk metric. Um, so we developed a, a new risk metric that we use that, that is meant to better understand and better address questions of equity. And this is expected annual structural damage. And uh, you'll see this referred to uh, repeatedly through the plan um, and uh, uh, is, is explained in the plan in, in more detail than I think we have time for right now. But it is uh, uh, an effort to uh, better address questions of, of uh, equity and as a response to uh, criticism about uh, other metrics that have been used in, in the project selection process in the past. Uh, I, I covered this a couple slides ago when we were uh, talking about the, the scenarios, but again, uh, the goal of this uh, uh, improvement was rather than pinning our planning efforts to a single scenario, uh, and then hoping for better outcomes, 
uh, when we do that, when we uh, select based on a single scenario, we're potentially, uh, we're making trade-offs. If we, we uh, realize a different scenario, uh, then we probably have other projects we could have invested in that would have performed better. We developed this robust project selection process that is designed to give us a suite of projects that will perform well, whether we realize, uh, again, that more moderate future scenario or a more severe uh, future uh, environmental scenario. And then lastly, uh, this is kind of stepping away from the project prioritization process. We, we, the, the improvements we've talked about to this point have been about how we use these tools to select projects. Uh, we also spent a fair amount of time uh, on these uh, additional modeling efforts or additional analyses uh, to try to illustrate how the coast is going to change, to try to make that uh, more understandable, more accessible to folks, uh, rather than me talking about percentage increases in abstract uh, um, metrics, uh, we decided to, to spend some time trying to, trying to illustrate how the coast is going to change and how people may experience that. And so one example of that is a high tide flooding analysis. And a few of these are written up as vignettes in the, in the plan itself. Um, this is an example of, of uh, Delcom, and we selected kind of uh, key locations uh, in the community. It may be a, a community center, it may be uh, a low point on a road, and in this case we looked at uh, an area of Delcom that's at East Main Street and, and South President Street. Uh, it's a particularly uh, low area, and we're identifying how frequently those areas are going to be impacted by high tide flooding, and I should have said this at the top, but when we're talking about high tide flooding, we're not talking about tropical storms or hurricanes. We're talking about kind of usual weather, usual weather patterns, uh, frontal passages, so a high tide event, co occurs with a, a north wind and uh, we get water that, that uh, sometimes inundates roads, sometimes inundates uh, 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 areas, again, that, that are of, of lower elevation. And what we're trying to illustrate here is, is uh, some of these areas, uh, in this example, uh, under current conditions, uh, it's probably flooded a few times a year uh, due to high tide flooding events. Uh, 25 years from now, with continued sea level rise, with uh, continued subsidence, uh, we're projecting under our lower scenario that would be uh, uh, inundated about uh, uh, at least once a week for about 30 weeks of the year. So about half of the, the weeks of the year you would see uh, at least one uh, flooding event. And as we look 50 years into the future, uh, that becomes a, a situation that, again, without action, um, you may see uh, nearly every week of the year. Stu, we got a question uh, from Secretary Brown. Yeah, first of all, oh, thank you. This is very good information. So you kind of piqued my interest. You know, we have a plan that's going to be protective of the coast, and you mentioned equity. So can you give me an example of how you would incorporate that as a process improvement? And, you know, are you talking about just priority of projects? Can you expound just a minute? Sure. Um, so the uh, – uh, the metric that we developed, the expected annual structure damage, was developed uh, based on kind of a, a criticism of other metrics that are used for uh, project selection. So the impetus was that uh, the methodologies that we use are, are they're commonly used measurements, but they're, they're measuring potential future damages in dollars. Um, there are a lot of different uh, techniques for doing this. Um, and so it is a useful metric. It's important for us to be able to say if we invest X amount of dollars, we can reduce this many dollars in risk. Uh, but one of the criticisms of measuring risk in terms of dollars is that it can implicitly prioritize projects that protect areas that have more valuable assets, so mm -hmm. wealthier, uh, more affluent neighborhoods. And so uh, the expected annual structure damage metric was developed to remove that asset value from the equation to try to understand what if we are, we are uh, agnostic to the value of these structures, how many structures can we protect? And so um, we used both of these metrics in our project selection. We weighted them uh, evenly in our, our project selection process, but we also used them to test against each other and see where there were discrepancies uh, and where, uh, uh, in the case of, of these structural risk reduction projects, you might see uh, differences in, in uh, outcomes if you were to 
uh, prioritize one metric or the other. Right, it makes sense. So as you go out to your constituents and all the folks and all the meetings, those are talking points you probably need to make sure you emphasize. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and so uh, the, the high tide flooding is just one piece of our uh, exploratory analysis. A lot of these are written up in the, the regional sections, different analyses we did, again, to try to help illustrate how people may experience uh, a changing coast. Uh, also, the, the uh, document is, um, uh, you know, it's 180 pages or so. Uh, we have an awful lot of material and, and additional reports that are going to be, uh, that many have been, some are, are still in process and, and will be published over the next few weeks or so, uh, that goes into more detail about uh, uh, high tide flooding and, and additional analyses we did related to that and other exploratory analysis we did. All right. So the... Uh, the master plan itself. The, the plan identifies 61 restoration projects, 12 structural risk reduction projects, and $11 billion for non-structural risk reduction. Uh, just a few highlights uh, of the restoration. We identify $2.7 billion of new diversions, and I highlight new uh, because the mid Barataria diversion, the mid Breton diversion, as well as the river reintroduction to Maurepas Swamp are assumed to be in our future without conditions. Those are not projects we evaluated for this master plan. These are projects that uh, we assumed would be on the landscape. We did this because we expect them to be constructed. And we did this because we want to select future projects that work synergistically with those projects and, and importantly, don't uh, uh, interfere with the, the uh, effectiveness of those projects. Um, the plan also outlines over $19 billion in dredging projects. So uh, as with the implementation update you just saw, as with the, the annual plan, plan that outlines our expenditures, dredging projects remain a huge part of our uh, uh, current and future uh, uh, restoration strategy. Uh, that $19 billion is, is summing the marsh creation projects and land bridge projects. There's additional dredging projects associated with Barrier Island, so that number may be closer to, to around $21 billion of the $25 uh, billion dollar, uh, uh, program. That, uh, that, and then lastly, that, that too I'm holding up was, say it again. Say it again. Uh, Dredging projects are a huge component of our uh, current plans and a, a huge component of our future plans in terms of uh, coastal restoration. Can you say it one more time? Dredging <laughs> is a huge component. <laughs> it, is, it is the largest it component. Is, it is by far the largest component of our, our restoration strategy. All right. Anybody else uh, want to hear it four, four times? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Bren can hit it a few more times in the <laughs> annual plan. Uh, uh, and then lastly, I, I want to touch on, we have uh, $2.5 billion identified for programmatic uh, uh, restoration projects. And so um, there are a handful of projects that for, for different reasons uh, are best uh, implemented uh, at, a, uh, at a programmatic level. That is, uh, for different reasons, they, they are... Um, things that we need to be more adaptive than a six-year plan. Barry Islands, for example, are highly responsive to where the most recent storm uh, came through in terms of which Barry Islands to, to uh, focus on. Uh, and we have programs that, that can help implement projects. We have the BISM program at CPRA. Other uh, programmatic types of projects like small-scale hydrologic restoration, oyster reef restoration, shoreline protection. These are projects, uh, uh, Chip touched on this with the, the discussion of the partnership fund. These are smaller scale projects that we know are, are effective, sometimes on a smaller scale than we look at through these master plan uh, uh, evaluations uh, and our, our projects that we support uh, and are best implemented through programs like the Partnership Fund, like QIPRA, like the Parish Matching Program, where those projects can be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, what this master plan delivers, under our lower scenario, the uh, uh, plan, in terms of restoration, the plan delivers 314 square miles of land that is built or ma maintained that otherwise would have been lost at year 50, 
And then under the higher scenario, around 233 square miles of land that, that uh, is built or maintained that would otherwise be lost at year, year 30, that we do see uh, a significantly greater benefit at year uh, 40. Uh, but a lot of those projects, and we'll see this in, in uh, maps on the next few slides, um, that are, are selected and implemented early in the, the, uh, the modeling process uh, are really effective for 30, 35, 40 years, but when you get to that final decade, are no longer able to keep pace with, uh, with uh, continued subsidence and accelerated uh, sea level rise under that higher scenario. So uh, first we're going to step through the lower scenario. This is land change um, uh, yeah, at year 10, at year 20, year 30, year 40, and year 50 under the lower scenario. And then this is under the higher scenario at uh, year 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. And you see some of those projects, uh, particularly, uh, uh, well, uh, areas, you can look at areas around Grand Isle, areas in, in southwest Terrebonne, uh, Marsh Island. Uh, those no longer persist through the, the full 50 years, and we see them come off the landscape. But again, uh, 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 we are, are uh, hopeful that this is not the, the future we realize. This is uh, um, something that we are, uh, again, believe is important to plan for, uh, but not necessarily something that, that uh, we're predicting. Um, with structural risk reduction, we identify 12 uh, structural projects, levees, flood walls, uh, floodgates, at a cost of $14 billion. Um, then we also identify $11.2 billion uh, uh, for non-structural uh, risk reduction. And so by non-structural, we're talking about elevating homes, flood-proofing businesses, uh, voluntary acquisition of, of residences in areas that are exposed to particularly high uh, uh, levels of flooding. Uh, and so in our analysis, the, in our analysis, uh, basically it shows that of that $25 billion uh, 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 risk reduction budget, uh, 11.2 billion is best spent on non-structural mitigation. Uh, in this plan, we don't specifically identify communities as being in or out of the plan for non-structural uh, risk reduction uh, because we don't want to preclude certain communities from having access to uh, funding sources that may require consistency uh, with the master plan. But what we do have uh, is a lot of information at a community level about existing risk, the amount of risk that could be bought down through uh, various non-structural measures. And this can be a starting point for communities who want to explore uh, non-structural uh, uh, alternatives or communities that are seeking funding through a range of, of uh, different funding sources to try to implement those projects. And so these are projected flood depths given a 1% uh, 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 event or 1% or, uh, annual exceedance probability at year 50, and you see that distinct uh, shift uh, between what is on the kind of the outside of the levee systems and what is on the inside of the levee systems. Whoa. Excuse me. Uh, and this is the difference of with and without action. So with these projects, you can see around the Morgans of the Gulf system, we're reducing flood depths behind that system, again, in the 1% uh, annual exceedance probability by, by in, in most cases, uh, over nine feet. And when we look at this in terms of risk, uh, we, of course, see corresponding reductions in risk associated with those projects. Interestingly, uh, a, a few things on this, this uh, map. We do see risk reduction in the Southwest. There are not structural protection projects in the Southwest. That risk reduction is associated with uh, the restoration projects that are selected. So that is good to see that we are seeing the risk reduction associated with the, the uh, uh, restoration projects. I'm, there are, are still, uh, there's still quite a lot of need in terms of risk reduction uh, in that area. Um, but we do see that, that uh, impact of the restoration projects. So um, in total, uh, what the plan delivers, uh, risk re reduced compared to a future without action. Uh, under the lower scenario, we see a 70% reduction in risk if fully implemented. Under the higher scenario, a 60% reduction in risk. 
uh, as measured in expected annual annual damage in dollars, we're seeing a, a $10.8 billion uh, uh, reduction in, in expected annual damage under the lower scenario and a $14.6 billion reduction uh, under the higher scenario. Uh, if we're measuring this in expected annual structure damage, we actually see a greater proportional uh, reduction, 78% under the lower scenario and 65% under the higher scenario. Stu, if I could jump in uh, quickly, those dollar figures that you see listed there are annualized, correct? So that's at year 50, that's for that's the year, year 50. 50. Um, so for each year prior to that, you've got something on the order of billions of dollars of potential risk reduction as well. Yes, thank you. Um, and so, uh, as, as Bryn mentioned at the top, this level of investment could mean that in 50 years under the lower scenario, uh, Louisiana has less flood risk from hurricanes and tropical storms than we do today. So what's next? Um, the public comment period runs through March 25th. Uh, public comments can be sent uh, via email to masterplan.la.gov. Uh, they can be sent in writing to the address uh, listed on the screen. Uh, they can also be made at uh, any of the four public hearings. Uh, January 31st, we're gonna be in Baton Rouge. Uh, we're gonna be in New Orleans on the 7th, or, or sorry, we're gonna be in Homa on February 2nd. We're gonna be in New Orleans on February 7th, and we'll be in Lake Charles on uh, February 16th. Um, based on this feedback, we will be uh, revising the plan, and we will be coming back to you guys on uh, April 19th with a, a uh, final plan for your approval, uh, and then plan to submit to the, the legislature shortly after that approval. Um, so also, I do want to uh, uh, ask once again that you take, a, uh, take some time to really uh, look at the plan itself. Um, but the plan is not just the, the document that you guys have in front of you. We also have a data viewer that's available to, to uh, help look at any of these outputs we've shown in terms of land change, in terms of flood depths, in terms of risk, um, but also look at the individual projects um, on, on the landscape. Uh, we also have quite a bit of, of supporting information and, and uh, appendices and supporting materials that are that are on our website. And we also have, uh, uh, we've been doing this throughout the process, we've been recording a lot of the, the presentations that we've done um, so that we, we have those available as a resource. Um, a lot of these are based, are, are uh, focused on model improvements and parts of the plan that, that uh, we've been developing over the last uh, several years so uh, there are a lot of resources and certainly if you have questions you can reach out to us at, at masterplan at la.gov all right all right thank you Stu any other comments uh, Secretary Brown I see your light is still blinking I don't know if that's a mistake or if you had a follow-up uh, Ms. Cormier and Mr. Bourgeois, you'll be next. Thank you, Stu. I, I know for the viewing public out there, you you guys have done a great job. I know that in the 2017 plan, you'll had like a terabyte of information and and you've done it really well and you put it in terms where it looks like uh, everyone can understand. So I appreciate that. I do have a question about are you going to publish the parish fact sheets like you did, or are you going to move to a regional aspect? I know we as board members have to look at the whole coast whole, holistically and, and try to decide as a group, but when the average citizen comes into a meeting, they only want to know what's happening in Lake Charles or Homa or whatever. I thought those were really helpful last time. So the answer is, is yes, both of those things. We're going to have parish fact sheets um, uh, shortly. We'll also have regional fact sheets for the five regions. We also eventually probably, those uh, we expect to have in the next couple weeks, we also expect to have um, a community fact sheets. So at a smaller scale, there's around 300 communities. Um, some of those we, we've aggregated, but we'll have uh, uh, kind of more localized fact sheets eventually. Uh, on the fact sheet front, the uh, Project fact sheets went up this morning, so we have the project fact sheets online, uh, and, and the next step is the parish fact sheet and the, the regional fact sheets. Russell, did you plant that question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Russell's been pushing for the parish fact sheets. I, I agree with you, uh, Lori, that they are very helpful. Yeah. 
So, uh, let's see here, Mr. Bourgeois. Okay, um, so I I, I want to start with uh, I've, I've been part of the um, the Coastal Advisory Team, the Regional Work Group for Par- Barataria, Regional Work Group for Terrebonne, and I feel like I've been watching this since. 2018 with you guys my first comment is can we please retire the photo of the boat turning i mean if we haven't seen that a thousand times we let the guy make the turn okay (laughs) um you know but but the idea is uh the the thing i really want to say is that it i have been part of it more as an observer than a contributor in my mind but i think that you know every question that was ever asked was answered with an incredible amount of detail from all of the team members. They labored over every single decision that was made. They were very careful to not do things just because they could do it, but to decide where things really needed to be. So it's 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 was been an outstanding process to follow. I think the work is, is tremendous. The proof is in the actual plan. Um, that said, I, I did get the, the the my first copy of the printed version of this and, and spent some time with it this weekend. There's a couple of things that, that I saw were, were typos as far as, you know, legacy text that made it through from a project that was in 2012 was there. It said it went to LaRose. Well, now it's going to Raceland. So there's things like that I'll get back with you on. But uh, I did feel like I... Um, I, I, I was being tested to see if I was reading it <laughs> when I got to page 175 and found in the beyond the plan, so I don't have a problem with the plan, but the beyond the plan part of the risk rating 2.0 um, data. And I think it's good that you would have include something as important as the the dynamics of what risk rating 2.0 will be i just take issue with just using fema's talking points and um i mentioned that to chip and uh i think he agrees with me that we we probably need a little work on that particular one but i you know notwithstanding that that's beyond the plan that's not the plan so it's really <laughs> um not to take away from the tremendous work that these guys did and, and just compliment y'all on that well I, i'll jump in here uh <coughs> Stu, and thank you for that uh Dwayne, appreciate it the um i I know I can speak for Stu when I say that he recognizes that there's a there's an issue with that section as well uh, that will be addressed. Um, so we appreciate you bringing that to our attention. And uh, yeah, any of the typos or any of the legacy text, anything like that, obviously we we welcome. Um, that's how we make this document better. Yeah, I, I just encourage everybody. You know your projects very well. Look at look at the text in there. Make sure that there's nothing that got carried over from from a previous plan or what have you. So, so Dwayne, I want I want to jump in here because I think that this is an important distinction between CPRA the agency and CPRA the board. Uh, and when it comes to the section on risk rating 2.0, I, I think that's a position that the board needs to be clear about and perhaps direct the agency on what the position of the state should be when it comes to that. This is the policy setting board of the state. Um, And so I'm not aware of any other member of this board that's been more active in NFIP, in risk rating 2.0. And so I would ask that you work with the staff on crafting that section to where it reflects the position of this board and that there is an nfip subcommittee of this board that's met a couple of times but this this is an issue uh members that continues to kind of rise more and more to the top uh year after year and i think it's something that we're we as a state are going to have to get our head around and figure out how we're going to tackle it so Mr. Bourgeois, if, if members of the board are okay with that, um, I would we would rely on. I'll take a motion for that. I've got a motion by Miss Gorman, a second by Miss Cormier for. Uh, see, you speak, Dwayne. You're going to get more work. <laughs> uh, There's nothing new. Uh, so. if to uh, if board member uh, Dwayne Bourgeois could work with staff on on crafting uh, the position. We'll do. Yep. Look forward to that. Thank you. I didn't hear a vote, so it's not official. So. I got a, is there any public comment on the on the motion? <laughs> Is there any objection to that to that motion? Uh oh. Now, no. sit there and be quiet. Now, okay. how about that? Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. Let's see here, Mr. Banks, and then uh, President McGinnis. You'll be next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it, Stu and Bren. Very good presentation. Very um, 
impressive the amount of work you guys do and so I commend you for that my question goes to the uh, work groups and the advisory groups and and people in the process as you mentioned on page 26 and I just want to try to get a better understanding of how those people are selected I, I certainly uh, I'm not talking about agency representatives or federal partners or whatever but but community people people from the community people from uh, the areas of the coast who live and work along the coast can you give us a little insight on how folks uh, from that sector are are selected thank you um, in a lot of cases it's about people who've who uh, we've worked with before who have shown interest in in the work we're doing uh, certainly when we're looking for for agency representatives we, we reach out to you all and, and provide recommendations uh, one of the the uh, things we didn't cover for the improvements from the the last plan was uh, we also know that there are uh, a huge amount of people who are deeply impacted by coastal land change by flood risk that, that don't normally participate in these meetings. When we have a, a board meeting or we have a quipper meeting or we have uh, any of the, the uh, different meetings we have, we have a lot of the same folks in the room uh, uh, all the time. And so we developed a, a community engagement work group uh, to try to, to see how we can, can reach different communities, ones that we uh, understand to be deeply impacted by these issues uh, and have better engagement from uh, those communities. Um, that is a, a uh, will forever be an ongoing process. We're, we're never going to get it right, but I will say the community conversation meetings that we had over the last uh, couple months across the coast, we saw a lot of new faces. Um, I think we can uh, uh, at least say that we're making progress in, in uh, trying to make sure that, that uh, you know, coastal changes and, and uh, uh, the impacts of that are not a, a uh, niche issue for a handful of stakeholder groups that have been involved in these these processes for a long time but for all coastal citizens who, who uh, in some cases uh, have not been part of that process sorry got a text message from the boss so I'm responding <laughs> here uh, President McGinnis thank you mr. chairman Stuart and Bren, uh, I tell you, um, to, to do this plan and to use all of the modeling for the, the whole coast of the state of Louisiana and then to talk specifically to people like me, and I know we have a council member here today, and you spent as much time as we needed to explain our parochial issues um, as it pertains to the master plan. I see you smiling there. I'm not going to get on you today about those things. And, 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 and it's amazing um, how we come up with this plan. And, and it creates questions. It should, right, because, you know, we're talking about science and how that relates to people's lives. And this is, you know, for a lot of us, it's our mortality we're looking at here, right, and, and what decisions we make today and how that's going to affect our life. We're talking about people. We're not talking about, you know, islands and marsh creation you know this is people and and i that's what i appreciate when you guys put these plans together i believe you know you really look at what you know so people can have an idea of what they're going to be doing in the future and what, what they're looking at the mr go ecosystem restoration plan um it's just now coming into um, coming back at us, right? Was, did that play a part in any of the decisions you made with projects or any of your modeling? Because, you know, what that is is mitigation for the, the damage that the Mr. Go caused in that area. Um, was that um, factored into any of your modeling? Uh, it was not. And, well, it is in that some of the projects that we evaluated are also featured in the, the uh, Mr. Go Ecosystem Restoration uh, Program, as well as some of the projects that we've already constructed or already under construction um, are in the modeling. Uh, but the, in terms of the most recent decision, um, or, or uh, in the, the word of bill, I believe, uh, that didn't uh, feed into it. But we do, in the uh, section on, on uh, the Pontchartrain and Breton areas, we do have kind of a call-out box on the map uh, talking about the potential impact that that having that funded, having that fully federally funded, could uh, provide for uh, for the area. Um, so, 
uh, it's not captured in the modeling. It is hopefully captured in the plan. And uh, we had to write that text box back before the word was passed, and we can update that um, as we move to the final plan. Yeah, and, and, and you mentioned it earlier. It was just a little, you know, um, comment about that all of these projects that you decide on, and I just wanted to make sure I brought this up, you know, with the board, is based on a model um, of our projects, and one of the largest ones is, is the diversion um, in, in the, the Breton area, right? So all of that modeling is done and projects are selected based on that project and the effect that it's going to have over 50 years, and it's not permitted. You know, the concern on our end is, and, you know, we had a project that um, because of that was, was, um, uh, was rejected um, because of the flooding that, that would cause, by, basically, I don't want to get into, but, but because of that, right? So, you know, our concern um, is that if it doesn't get permitted, and if some of the mitigation that comes out during the EIS is something different than you guys aren't thinking, um, a project like that might be inserted into the plan if we would have known that today. And I get all of that changes, um, and, and we'll be back here for another update in a few years too, right? So I just wanted to me mention that, and um, I just wanted a, a clarification, Brent, maybe you can answer. I know when, when we pass this plan, is the Breton diversion going to be officially now 75 or because right now it's officially at 35 we're permitting it at 75 and your model is at 75 no no um okay. i think our, our model is at uh 40 uh, a max of 40 uh but we had to select a operations regime for for the modeling but no we did not look at the the 75 but I, I, if I may jump in as well, I think that there is so so we have to sort of move forward and plan with the information that's in front of us today. And I certainly understand your concern as well. What if some some of this doesn't come to fruition? We do have an opportunity before the six years to make adjustments uh, related to you know if a, if a large project that's assumed to be on the ground uh, again is is uh, doesn't happen or we're sure that it's not going to happen. For example, we can adjust the plan um you know in the interim to to account for that so we have that opportunity uh we have not really had to do that in the past but um that may be something that we need to do in the future for, for this passage um are we going to change the 35 to 75 which you guys are trying to get permitted or what are we going to do there no no it's you uh, leave it yes okay thank you thank yep. you mr chairman is that it okay Mr. Banks, you're good. You're blinking again. And so are you, Mr. McGinnis. Nope. Okay. One more time. Okay. All right. Still blinking, McGinnis. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Stu or Bryn? As I mentioned earlier, we are going to take public comments at the at the end of this meeting. If you want to make a public comment, there's cards located on the table outside in the hall. Just follow the instructions on the card, and then I'll call you up at the appropriate time. You can give your comment card either to the sergeant at arm at the door or to Inger, and we'll um, they can bring them up here to me. Or Charles has got some over here. Charles, wave your hand. All right. Any other? We don't need a motion or anything to set this in formal public comment. I know we've already started, but we, we would need that on the uh, 19th, April 19th, on the final approval. The final, I know that. I know we got the board's got to approve it, but I didn't know if we need it. <clears throat> and I don't see any of our legal team in here. There he is. David's in the back. Okay, good. All right. Well, thanks everybody for a good discussion. I always enjoy engagement from the from the board members and um we look forward to getting a final plan in april yep thank, thank you all. thank you all very much all right well Brent, don't go far because we're going to get an update on the draft 2024 annual plan and um remember members we're going to fold the chapel basin plan 
into this agenda item as well. One of the things that I should have said at the beginning, members, is I know a lot of you show up to the state capitol when we're going through the approval process for our annual plan, but this year it's important to know that the, the master plan and the annual plan are going to move simultaneously. So when we're in committee for the master plan, the annual plan will be approved uh, or heard on that same day. Now there's going to be separate legislative vehicles meaning that there will be a resolution to approve the master plan which will be under an SCR or an HCR and there will be a, a resolution to approve the annual plan. So while you'll see two separate legislative vehicles will be in committee at the same time and hopefully on the floor of the Senate and the House at the same time with both. Kevin? Okay. Again, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and to piggyback onto that comment, I should have mentioned earlier, uh, as we were talking about the master plan public meetings, we'll be um, tag teaming the, the annual plan with the, at the same meetings as well. So uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little more detail in just a minute, but just know that the public meetings will cover both the master plan and the annual plan uh, for this coming year. So um, happy to be here today to present to you the 15th annual plan that's been produced by CPRA. Um, there is um, um, a lot to talk about in this plan. We've already talked a lot about uh, a planning already, but uh, certainly this is kind of where the, where the rubber hits the road, right? So the master plan is kind of the high level, broad overview of what we think the priorities for our, our coast will be over the next six years. And the fiscal year annual plan really is um, talking about where we're you know, going to put our money, where we're going to put our money, um, uh, hopefully where our mouth is, right? Uh, in the upcoming fiscal year and then the, the, the next two fiscal years. So a couple of differences you'll note uh, in the fiscal year uh, 2024 annual plan that will be presented to you here today in draft form one uh, you'll note that there's a big number associated with it so chairman klein alluded to this earlier uh, we anticipated that potential uh, revenues and expenditures in the current fiscal year um, would be about 1.3 billion dollars and you'll see in this in this uh, upcoming year's annual plan that we will uh, likely exceed that number uh, you'll also note that We've been able to include some of the front matter material that typically would end up in the final plan uh, as part of the draft. So we know that material can be very helpful to folks who are talking with constituents uh, or people they represent um, and uh, stakeholders across the coast. And so um, um, we have we've heard in the past that that's something that folks were looking for, and uh, we made an effort and we're able to get that included uh, in this draft plan. So. Um, right off the bat, we already talked a little bit about public comment, but they can be received uh, at this email address, coastal at la.gov. Written comments will be accepted at the address you see here. Um, and of course, in-person public comments will be received uh, today and at the meetings that I'll uh, li lay out in just a moment. They're the same dates and locations as the master plan meetings and times for that matter. Um, and those comments uh, will be due to us by March 25th, as in uh, uh, as was the case for the master plan comments. So as it relates to the timeline, uh, I think I've hit all of these actually already. Uh, we will, of course, take public comment on this plan, incorporate that into the final plan and present it to you at the April 19th board meeting. So just to go back over those dates and locations, on January 31st, we'll be presenting this plan uh, in Baton Rouge. Uh, there will be live stream available for that for folks who are not able to attend a meeting in person. And they can view it there. Um, February 2nd will be in Homa. February 7th will be in New Orleans, and February 16th will be in Lake Charles. And so the um, sort of the the, um, the program, if you will, for the meeting will be an open house for a couple of hours from 3:30 to 5:30. We'll be have people there that are able to discuss both the master plan and the annual plan. We'll present on both of those something similar to what you've seen here this morning uh, from 5.30 to 7.30. And for full details, you can visit our website, the calendar uh, on our website. So you all have seen this slide a number of times before. This is uh, the uh, projected both revenues uh, and expenditures for the upcoming year. So they include the funding sources that you all are familiar with, GOMESA, NERDA, NIFWIF. Uh, restore, Quipra, uh, and so forth. And so we do anticipate expending the revenues that we would uh, receive or would be made available to us in FY24. I mentioned this number uh, was higher than the last year's number. And so you'll note uh, we anticipate receiving and expending a little over $1.7 billion. So that is a healthy number, uh, a number that um, uh, many of us weren't sure if we'd see in our career, but uh, happy to be able to report uh, another potential record-breaking year coming up in FY24. Also, again, happy to report about 85% of that is going toward construction. You can see how the other uh, um, components of our, our project development and project monitoring break out there. 
Um, importantly, about 2% of that dollar figure will go to our operating costs, so we continue to keep those uh, low and be a lean agency. Looking into the future, um, you see similar uh, expenditures expected over the $1 billion amount in FY25 and FY26. Uh, much of that goes towards uh, construction of those projects. You see anywhere from 85 to 90% related to construction, and again, I just point out those operating costs remain low in the 2 to 3% two to range. <clears throat> so some of the uh, by the numbers things I wanted to mention I've talked about the total uh, potential investment over the next fiscal year about one and a half billion of those dollars will go toward construction uh, in keeping with our theme uh, from the master plan uh, discussion 20 of those projects will be dredging projects so I'll say it again uh, dredging has been and will continue to be a major focus of our coastal program those projects will dredge a little over 73 million cubic yards of, of sediment to benefit about 14,000 acres um, of our coastal wetlands that uh, that volume of sediment there, just to put it in, in more easily understandable terms, uh, <clears throat> represents close to 16 superdomes worth of sediment. If you filled the superdome with sediment 16 times, that's about what we anticipate dredging uh, in the upcoming fiscal year. So we'll have 118 active projects in the upcoming year. 94% of our expenditures we expect to be directly related to projects. Um, and importantly, and I alluded to this in my implementation update, as we're uh, you know, developing our coastal program and developing the workforce to support that program, uh, a potential investment of $1.7 billion will support uh, over 10,000 direct jobs. Um, so a, t a significant driver in terms of, uh, of jobs in the state and uh, result in labor income of about $641 million. I want to thank our friends at GNO Inc. for helping crunch those numbers. Uh, and providing those uh, figures to us uh, every year. So we'll start off in the various regions of the state. Uh, first in the southwest region, uh, where 15 projects will be active in FY24. Nine of those will be in construction and six in, in engineering and design. Some of those projects of note include the Gulf Shoreline Protection Project, where we would extend essentially uh, rock breakwaters and shoreline protection features along the Cameron uh, Parish shoreline, similar to what we've seen at the Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the Southwest Coastal Louisiana uh, effort, we are very close to signing a PPA with the Corps of Engineers on that project, um, and then we can kick off some of the non-structural investments um, um, from the money made available to uh, through the federal government and, of course, uh, through our master plan and annual planning efforts as well. Uh, Long Point Bayou Marsh Creation Project is another one of note here. This is a, a NERDA project, but it's not associated with the BP oil spill. It was associated with a, a different oil spill um, in that region. It was uh, actually a project that was developed and designed under the Quipper program and then shifted uh, to be implemented through uh, NERDA dollars. Um, I should mention, and I didn't yet, but um, uh, another project that's on slate here, and we've talked a little bit about this, is the um, is the Calcasieu um, uh, Large Scale Marsh Creation and Hydrologic Restoration Project. It represents about a two hundred and sixty two million dollars uh, million dollar investment in this region, and we are uh, advancing that project and getting it closer and closer uh, to construction. So moving to the east, we will uh, talk about the South Central region. There'll be forty one. Speaking speaking of that project, Brent, I, I know that. We met yesterday and we discussed a little bit, but I think it's been a while since the board's been briefed. Lori, I don't know if if you've got an update, but let's let's plan on doing a brief in February on that project. Absolutely, where we are on that reprogramming, please. Ha happy to do that. Um, so again, in the South Central region, uh, 41 active projects, 26 of those in construction, 14 in E and D, and one project in planning. So a few projects of note in this region include the West Fushan Marsh Creation Project. That's a project where we're actually partnering with the port, uh, and hopefully we'll be using some bar material from the navigation channel there to create marsh uh, west of uh, the Fushan area. The Henderson Lake Water Management Unit uh, Spoil Bank Gapping Project is a, a water quality and, and water uh, movement project that should improve fish and wildlife habitat in the Atchafalaya Basin. It also has a secondary benefit uh, of potentially reducing water levels that back up through by Katah and on up into as far north as LaSalle Parish. Um, the Morganza of the Gulf Project uh, needs no introduction with this board, of course, and, and its importance, but significant federal funding was uh, provided to the uh, program uh, last year, and many parts of it are advancing nicely. 
the Rose to Golden Meta system improvements are, are underway, uh, and, and as they uh, have been in years past, the system, of course, performed quite well during Hurricane Ida, um, and uh, we were certainly glad to see that. A few other projects, the North Lafourche uh, Reach 2 project, the H&C Canal Lock Complex project, and the Grand Bayou Pump Station project will all be underway uh, in FY24. In the southeast region, there will be 62 projects active uh, in the upcoming fiscal year. 45 of those will be in construction, 16 in E&D, &D, and another project in planning. So again, a couple of projects of note include the Payette Basin uh, Tidal Protection Project. This is in the Lafitte area, uh, an area that was extremely hard hit, of course, by Hurricane Ida. And uh, we're glad to be advancing the uh, risk reduction uh, investment that the state has made over the years uh, and has committed to make in the future in the greater Lafitte area. Of course, we've already talked a little bit about the West Shore Lake Pontchartrain um, Hurricane Risk Reduction Project. Uh, construction began on it just recently, and we're excited uh, to see that project underway for the River Parishes region and then the large-scale Barataria Marsh Creation Project being built um, just south, basically, of Lafitte in that area. So a few other uh, projects I want to mention in the area, the Lake Bourne Marsh Creation Project in St. Bernard Parish. I talked about that one really already. The Marpaw Swamp Diversion Project, I mentioned that as well. Uh, and the Ludvine Pump Station Project, which will be underway soon uh, as a result of um, uh, funding in this plan and past plans as well. So uh, Chairman Klein mentioned that, uh, unfortunately, Brian Lazina was not able to be here with us, so I wanted to uh, cover the Chafalaya Basin Annual Plan as well. Uh, it is incorporated as an appendix into our, our uh, FY24 annual plan. There are a few things of note I'll run through. There's some new projects uh, in this year's Chafalaya Basin uh, annual plan that were developed in coordination with the Technical Advisory Group, but uh, dredging in Big Bayou Pigeon from its confluence with Little Pigeon uh, on out toward uh, Grand Lake is included in, in this plan. Uh, Gimmick Canal improve its improvements as well. Uh, which would include clearing and snagging and, and uh, improving the canal in the Henderson region. Some point compete water uh, flow improvements for both flow and, and water quality are included here. The Henderson Lake Water Management Project, a uh, um, contract has been awarded, a bid has been accepted and contract has been awarded for that project. It is uh, in the construction phase and we'll begin turning dirt on that one very, very soon. Uh, for the Murphy Lake Depth Restoration Project, uh, we're doing geotechnical uh, work right there uh, at this point in time. It's in engineering and design, and the East Grand Lake Upper Region Project is uh, in permitting, and uh, we're anxious to get uh, that one underway as well. So some of the other projects involved uh, in this program, you see the BSA Swamp Base Camp. Uh, this is uh, um, working with a new dock facility at that location. Uh, we have accept, uh, a bid has been accepted, contracts been awarded on that, and it should be under construction shortly. Um, we're designing the Bayou Pigeon board, uh, Bayou Pigeon uh, boat launch, not board launch. That should read boat launch uh, improvements as well. And then the last update to the Chafalaya Basin um, uh, master plan was done in 1998, and we'll be looking to begin an update on that um, uh, here shortly. So, um, I think that's my last substantive slide. I do want to point out that we have uh, a viewer available associated with the annual plan, very similar to, uh, to the master plan. Um, I encourage you to go to ap24.coastal.la.gov. Uh, you can get it's a, just a, a plethora of information, a wealth of information related to the projects in the plan, uh, including uh, press clippings, videos, uh, location, project details, and so forth. Uh, and I'll just wrap up again by saying we'll accept comments uh, through March 25th, uh, both uh, written uh, and verbal uh, at our public meetings. And uh, I went through that rather quickly, but I know we had a lot on, on the agenda today, so I wanted to try to get through it, through it as quickly as possible. But anyway, if there are any questions associated with the FY24 draft annual plan, uh, I should have mentioned Joe Weibel is here with me. He is... Uh, um, the uh, the guru of the numbers in the plan, I would say. So uh, here, I would be happy to answer any questions for you. Yep. All right, uh, members. Let's see. I know Miss Goodson has a question. I want to make one comment before I turn it over to her. Is it um, members? I say this every year when we're developing the annual plan. Is that the last few years the state has run a surplus? and the governor and the legislature have been very kind to the coastal program in allocating hundreds of millions of, of surplus dollars to restoration and protection projects. And so we have uh, obviously have a list that we are compiling for the next fiscal year 
you you will not see that list in this plan in draft form but you will see it in the final uh, plan and so we're talking with the governor now we're going to be meeting with legislators and the division on our priorities for for surplus but I know that a lot of parish officials here have requested in levy districts and um, just wanted to in case you're looking for it in, in here you, you won't you won't find it until April okay uh, Miss Goodson for a question so, uh, I think a couple of times this morning we've heard the term dredging uh, come <laughs> up and and so I was kind of going to the next level asking about do we have uh, manufacturers of some of the dredging equipment in Louisiana do we have uh, is there something from the economic development perspective that we might need to look into to try to encourage that type of industry um, being here more, maybe even headquartered here, because we are spending an enormous amount of money. And I, I was really just curious as to what could the state do to try to encourage um, more development of that industry in the state? Yeah, you know, great question. And I will say that we do have a um, heavy presence of a couple of kind of the, the, the big players in the dredging industry that do have um, headquarters and or heavy, heavy um, um, presences here in the state of Louisiana. But one of the things that, that we do every year, and certainly um, we could probably improve upon it, it would take any assistance from, from LED or anybody else to help us uh, think through how to um, – how to improve uh, competition, right, and drive down costs um, by the number of dredgers that might be in the state and might be interested in our, in our projects is our, is our annual industry days that we partner with the Coast Builder Coalition on and, and others on. Um, what we have heard time and time again from the dredgers is um, if the market's there, we're going we're to come, right, we'll be there. So if the work's there, we're, we're, we're coming. And so we have done our very best through things like the annual plan, in fact, to try to put out, look, this is what our plans are over the, not just the next year, but the next three years um, and then a, from a master plan standpoint over the next six years that this is what's on the horizon so that they can plan um, uh, to be more involved in the coastal program. Um, we have seen, uh, I believe there, uh, a dredge was christened uh, just last year um, in um, in the Morgan City area. There may be another one under construction. I think Mr. Hidalgo might be able to speak to that. And I know there's one in construction in Bell Chase right now. So we've seen uh, the industry react to the um, increases in, in levels of funding and increases in the size of our jobs by um, by building more equipment and being more ready to, to respond to that. But certainly we're open to any suggestions and would, would uh, um, let me let me be quiet and let Mr. Hidalgo speak. I just I watched Chips Bill start look. twitching in his seat when you, <laughs> and I knew I was waiting for his light to come on. So I'm going to go to uh, Bill first and then I'll come to you, Dwayne. And, and I, I wish I could give an update, but the, I, I know of at least eight dredges that eight. are under construction right now in Louisiana. Okay. And uh, so uh, th there is some construction going on. And, and uh, in some cases, there's uh, options. So potentially it could be more than that okay uh mr bourgeois okay i'll be be quick since the last time i got an assignment um <laughs> i just want to say that you know uh, this version of an annual plan as the graphics and things improved in the in the master plan they're being nicely incorporated in here and, and i think this is really um one of the easiest reading annual plans as well just even though i'm seeing it really for the first time today so just um thanks for doing that and that's really it i got to get through some of the details but you know that's uh, uh that's all i wanted to add i just I, make I, note Dwayne, that there's no uh boat making a turn on on the annual plan so not even a yep <laughs> so we can add that to the file, right, right? <laughs> no, i appreciate that that comment mr bourgeois and, and we uh, as i mentioned we've heard Quite frankly, over the last few years, that it would be helpful to have some of that front matter material, and we've uh, we've fallen short, unfortunately. Um, but we were able to um, um, step up our game and get it included in this annual plan, and we certainly hope that that will uh, we, we will endeavor to make that happen again in future draft plans. All right. Any questions on any more further questions on annual plan or Chaffalai Basin plan? Hidalgo, you're still blinking, but I think you're done. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to an updated annual plan and 
a Chaffalai plan in April when we vote for final approval. And lastly, members, we're going to get a federal and congressional update. Lots of things happening in the nation's capital. And our good friend Neil McMillan's got a close hand, close eye on all of it. We're going to get an update from Neil. Public comment will be next. I don't have any public comment cards, maybe one from Charles. So if you want to make a public comment, please. Uh, let me see if I can retrieve uh, the presentation. Um, All right, thank you, thank you. All right, thanks for your attention, board. Appreciate this opportunity as Congress did. Uh, very many things in December um, since we last met in November. I uh, want to go over two major bills. Uh, one bill, the defense bill, we got a lot through it uh, from WERDA, and one with the omnibus that we got some good things and uh, maybe missed out on an opportunity. And then I'll hit on um, two other matters just to, to flag and but we'll start with the the word of bill and luckily it made the top 10 and you, you've heard a lot about it so I'll just hit some of the secondary measures since you've heard some of the top level items um, from Bren and uh, Chip and others um, first off we got a lot of authorizations for projects that are exciting to have to see uh, including upper barataria basin which um, I noticed was first authorized for a study in 1998. So we got it to the finish line in 2022, which is good to see. One thing you'll note with the, the dollar figure is they moved the price up based off increasing costs. So they were able to account for that um, from, from where the chief's report had been. And then you also see South Central Coastal, which had started off in 2006. So it made it to the finish line there, which is good to see. And then they added, uh, prioritization um, what they call expedited completion for St. Tammany Parish this doesn't um, really move it that much faster but it shows that it's an important project for the Corps to keep working on but it also lets the project go to PED the planning engineering design um, if it wraps up so it's that's a nice inclusion for it to have as well as that one uh, chugs along uh, we had a lot of improvements to call shares. Um, you've heard about the first two with 100%, but I'll also mention Algiers Canal levees. Um, the Corps is now going to have to resume doing 100% of that, which they had stopped after disaster supplemental funding from Katrina um, overrode a 1999 provision. So um, hopefully that can work out and um, get back to where you know we, th we think it should be. And then there's this new provision that... Um, have been discussed and was out of several versions but made into the final which allows non-federal sponsors like CPRA to use other federal funds for cost share um, there's been some back and forth on whether you can use federal funds for matches for your cost share and this language basically instead of asking for a separate agency to tell the core you can use it it assumes that it can be accepted and so I think this is a nice clarification for funds like GOMESA that we can clearly use those as our match. Um, and if we can grow GOMESA and continue to use that, um, that's a nice resource. It's something I think we can use as we talk to other states about GOMESA and revenue sharing, of like, hey, you've got these big Army Corps projects. This can be used as your call share. So we're going to try to communicate this provision to a lot of other um, offices with our revenue sharing efforts. So that was great to see. Uh, Hisers had a lot of um, action in this word. Um, some of y'all, we've talked about some of these things before, but basically it gives us more time and a little more flexibility and options to credit other related projects like our restoration projects that are integral to the system and hopefully get that matched up as we address the final uh, cost um, for the third payment, um, as well as letting the Corps continue to um, maintain and operate this as uh, factors like subsidence settlement occur. 
So keeping that a, a vibrant system as well as maybe looking to an expansion. So that's uh, all pretty exciting to see and um, should, should turn out well. And then this is kind of the grab bag. A few things I want to mention is that um, Section 8102, the Emergency Response to Natural Disasters, a big frustration is when we see projects that are core constructed continue to have the same damage again and again after we spend money to bring them back to where they were. Um, that was based on some kind of older guidance from the 1980s, maybe even before. With this provision, hopefully we can uh, improve and make some improvements and stop having the same there and back again cycle. So hopefully we can take advantage of that. I'm sure that's been a frustration um, when folks on the ground see similar things happen again. Um, we'll also mention the rehabilitation of pump stations. Uh, certain federal levies uh, in Louisiana have um, non-federally constructed pump stations along their alignment as they were kind of adopted in. Uh, this provision would let the Corps, if they get funding, apply that to um, projects like that. So um, kind of lets them have that option and could be a good thing for our local areas. And then finally, the Lower Mississippi River Basin Demonstration Program. This is not the exact same thing as the comprehensive plan that we got funded 100%, but this is trying to be a new um, 10 to $25 million project um, program that we can apply on the Lower Mississippi River. Um, it was kind of modeled after the EPA program, but um, hopefully the core can partner with um, stakeholders and, and do some of those medium-sized projects. Um, it'll be kind of difficult to get off the ground, and I think there's a lot of scrutiny that goes on any project in the Lower Mississippi River, but that's something that we will look to participate in and, and uh, you know, try to make that demonstration program something that's lasting. Also in the defense bill um, was a reauthorization of the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Restoration Program. This is a program under the EPA that has gotten um, a huge boost of funding with the infrastructure bill. Um, so now, where it previously had maybe under a million a year, it now will probably average 12 and a half or so million in the next five years. And so some reauthorization was recommended so that their master plan is fresh, um, that the scope was broad enough to include the whole basin, uh, administrative expenses cap, that type of thing. And uh, I'm glad to mention this because there's an active proposal period to rewrite the new comprehensive master plan that's due February 10th. Um, so they're inviting units of government, um, agencies, nonprofits to submit um, how they would plan out this um, Lake Pontchartrain Basin Restoration Program. So I guess new ideas, uh, reboot, um, some more federal statutory guidance as this program embarks on a kind of bigger era. So the second big bill is the omnibus bill, which is $1.7 trillion, and it passed right before Christmas. Um, we were able to get that done. And it was both the 12 funding bills as well as what um, Hill folks called the ash and trash, so some additional provisions that had consensus. Um, some things you probably heard about was Ukraine funding, but also uh, they did $38 billion in disaster relief and some other matters. Um, and I'll get to what was not included, as we likely all know, the RISE Act or Breeze Act were not included. But I'll point to the Disaster Relief Appropriations Act really quickly because two programs, the uh, EWP program and this Economic Development Administration grant program are kind of eligible for coastal Louisiana as it, the EDA program goes back to 2021 disaster. So there's some economic development opportunities uh, we should be eligible. And um, just a few other numbers for context. Um, most of that was driven by Florida and Puerto Rico. Um, so in the omnibus uh, was Army Corps funding. And you, you again, you'll see at the top how Congress really boosts the Corps' funding beyond what the the president's budget typically does. At the bottom are the projects that are kind of specific to Louisiana's coastal program. You see either projects that were in the budget or that were added through a congressionally directed spending item. Uh, certainly, Organs of the Gulf and Southwest Coastal uh, were 
we're projects the CPRA contributed a lot to uh, getting that included. We're also glad to see the Lower Mississippi River study continue to get funding as well as Lafitte's uh, federal study gets initiated. So that's uh, all encouraging to see. Uh, what's, what was not encouraging or frustrating was how the RISE Act or Breeze Act um, was not included in the omnibus. We were in conversation um, at the end, but uh, we did ultimately did not get cleared for passage. Um, some of the hurdles that our proponents are, you know, recognized would be a challenge and um, worked hard on, and then other ones were unanticipated. So when the RISE Act had a high cost that we discussed last board meeting, um, that just makes it more difficult as they try to tamper down how much spending is happening and even um, – at 1.7 trillion, there was a lot of flack about how how large a bill that was. And one way to offset a cost like revenue sharing automatically has a cost in the congressional um, budget scoring rules is to identify a pay for. That's either a revenue raiser like a tax or um, other methods like selling um, assets or rents or something. Um, leadership had implied to folks. Um, like Senator Cassidy that, you know, if, if you need to pay for, we can help you, you know, there's, there's options, but, um, when it came down to it, actually securing one, um, there wasn't really much time. Um, and it was hard to, to come to consensus. And I'll reemphasize that we really were in a good position, but the timing was really, really tough. So with the midterm elections being real contentious, the really, uh, small change overall um they're really dealing with the big ticket items like ukraine the disaster supplemental just the top line defense number and then all the extra was kind of done over a weekend so it was really a late friday to sunday night outcome and um you know we ultimately just didn't get there and I think some other factors that are, were tough was House Republicans, which is a big part of our delegation's makeup. Um, they were not participating in this negotiation, um, wanted to wait till this Congress to deal with it. Um, the House effort writ large was kind of relatively small for such an expensive bill, as you see from the numbers there, though uh, we were really encouraged by the late momentum we had. And then I guess some more House issues was the House Democratic com committee never never cleared the bill. They um, continue to share to our uh, nonprofit stakeholders that you know benefits from oil and gas are uh, untenable to them at the principal level. So I will say, Neil, you know, look, this remains to be one thing that just really disappoints me. That, but I, having said that, we were really close this year, or at the end of last year. I mean, the, the fact that we had this concept of increased revenue sharing for the Gulf states and revenue sharing for alternative sources of energy at the McConnell and Schumer level in negotiating an omnibus spending bill at the end of the year, I think is it's progress. We fell short once again, um, but this is going to be I don't. I don't know what the new Congress, what their priorities are going to be, or what the appetite for this is. We're not going to let up on this on this effort as long as all of us are here. I know that, but this is also going to bleed over into the next administration, and this this is something that the next governor is going to have to prioritize. Um, so this is the second time we we've fallen short on this. We get closer each time. We make more progress each time. And so that revenue sharing coalition that was formed is going to have to stay engaged in this. Um, and so th there's there's going to be discussions over the next several months on the, f the fact that we can't get increased revenue sharing. Well, what does the state do? Do we get creative in our financing? Do we, do we bond out revenue? What, what, what do those financial arrangements look like? Because I, I think that that is going to be a missed opportunity. If we don't get the increased revenue sharing, then what are what are the what are the ways in which we can finance to get projects on the ground sooner rather than later? And there's a lot of concepts that are swirling out there, but that's um, it's very frustrating. 
It is, and last board meeting we kind of went through the the momentum side, the positive sides that brought us to that, and this is kind of some of the the challenges. But you know, there was other wildlife bills that were major, like the Restoring America's Wildlife Act, that had a similar cost. They actually had a sort of a conceptual pay for looking at the cryptocurrency tax, something something really sh- far afield from a wildlife issue. Um, but they weren't successful either, and I think there was a lot of other things that in certain years were would have been worthy enough. Um, this year was particularly tough, but, you know, the more often we can be in that conversation, um, um, the better. So I um, certainly think we're a lot further along than, than last year. And our um, the staff and the, the members that we worked with, they're um, kind of rehuddling, you know, what we're going to do with this you know, interesting mix of Congress, but uh, no one's no one's relenting, and um, that's that's um, very important. So, um, and then two last things: uh, one, this bill passed in December, the Community Disaster Resilience Zone Act. I flag it basically because it's a mapping exercise that's going to fl- identify the top fifty at race at risk census tracts nationwide per hazard. There's 18 hazards, FEMA tracks here. And those identified tracks could receive a better call share for FEMA pre-disaster mitigation assistance like FMA, uh, BRIC. Uh, we expect a good bit of South Louisiana to eventually qualify for that, uh, for that better percentage, uh, which would help spread dollars. And so we will track that. And uh, when they finalize the map, that will probably be something um, we'll bring to your attention for your awareness. And then here is, um, to conclude, is one of the first large investments from the Inflation Reduction Act that we mentioned that I think could be used by our our partners and their environmental justice grants. So $100 million from EPA for this. Um, You see there's two funding opportunities. One, the um, cooperative, the collaborative problem-solving cooperative agreement program. is 30 million it's really focused at the nonprofit level including some of the really small nonprofits half a million 150k um, type projects to address local environmental issues so that would be um, something hopefully our our groups can apply for and then there's a government to government program that has state and local government involvement that you can um, EPA anticipates doing about a, a million or 70 million dollar projects they're about three years to basically boost capacity with governments to local populations. So you can, maybe you could get a grant and do outreach to different communities about a certain project or a certain opportunity. And um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that and um, see how that, uh, if there's some opportunity there. And um, that's the conclusion, uh, Chairman. All right, thank you, Mr. McMillan. Representative Zerang for question. Thank you. And thank you, Neil. Uh, just a couple questions on the Section 8149 use of other federal funds. Is that a strictly prospective or is there opportunities to go back and look at some either GOMESA projects and other things that we've done to try to secure some credit for that? Well, it, um, I guess, when an enactment it changed it from requiring an approval by the agency, which under GOMESA would have been the Mineral Management Service or Department of Interior, which had not been received, to saying, unless it's expressly prohibited, it shall be eligible. So I would think we could at least talk about that or, or look at the books. Um, it, didn't, it did not have a starting in this date. It just changed the status uh, completely. Okay. Well, to that end, on the extension for the payback for the, the state's cost share for NOV, I, I know there's interest in, in paying that back, but if there, you looked at extending to 2020, 2028 for negotiations for mitigation, is there, we pretty much settled that that figure is what it is and any work, we still can't negotiate that dollar figure down? On, on the on the cost share, state's cost share, and the 300, remaining 300 and something. Yeah, that the, the remaining payment on his dress is the remaining principal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, as, as Neil just said, the payment was delayed 10 years. Um, 
and that there was crediting provisions that would allow for us to but the the principle is is set it is what it is i, I don't think that there's any um language in the word of bill that will allow us to negotiate the actual principle now by delaying it interest does not accrue right okay so no interest but the but the principle remains the same of 1.1 billion we've made two 400 million dollar payments and then the third is i think around close to 360 360 but so. again i get that but there was some discussion as to maybe that some of that credit could be applied to that yeah sure boost that down so yeah oh yeah i'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry yes that is that is absolutely something that we're uh, pursuing with the Corps of Engineers, but uh, it's going to have to be the crediting package is going to have to be blessed by the feds, as you know, Z. So I think that we're trying to figure out which restoration projects uh, we could apply for credit, and so th those negotiations are have started. Okay. But the good thing is, and I was just talking with Ms. Goodson about this, is that the payment is delayed for ten years and no interest will accrue, and that gives us more than sufficient time to negotiate with the feds on what that ultimate crediting figure is going to be. Well, I get it, but I think there's interest because of the fact that we're in a fortunate position now that we do have some funding with projected deficits into the future, mm -hmm. and if you got it, you ought to pay it. But mm -hmm. just wondering if we do pay it, just for discussion purposes, making sure that if we do pay it that there's the opportunity to claw that back. But I don't know if okay. we'll, we'll pay it. I just wanted to make well, sure we let's so Let's – Let's take this offline if we could, because I think that we've got some uh, some figures in our head on which we think we can actually obtain credit for. And then if 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 you think the opportunity is there to make a payment, I'm certainly not opposed to it. Okay. But yes, the authority that was letting us negotiate on payment, the Section 1020, was going to expire uh, next year, and so that would have. Um, I have been really unfortunate to lose the opportunity. So we continue that for a few more years. So the negotiation on which project we identify should be able to conclude well in advance of the final payment being due. So um, there's some breathing room, but hopefully we can um, obviously get get through that and get, get over that um, obligation. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bourgeois? Um, I was really focusing on the um, RISE Act and how close we got and, and things of that nature. and and um don't know where we're going in the future but i know that a lot of us put some work in it and kind of towards your earlier comment mr chairman about the separation of this board's authority and cpra i know that cpra really worked very hard in putting the coalition together tap tapped a lot of us to do that but would it be appropriate and i'm at the risk of volunteering for some more work but in the beyond the master plan wouldn't some initiatives i don't know you can talk about pending legislation but the idea that's captured in rise and breeze for that matter wouldn't that be appropriate for something to put into the annual plan as a position of this board something along that line that that says that we need to look at legislation for further revenue sharing I, it might cross a line that peterson's in the back going get nervous about or something but i just wanted to throw it out there as a thought because I think we need to, as much as CPRA is pushed on RISAC and BRISAC, I think this board needs to push on RISAC and BRISAC. And maybe that's not the, the right avenue, but... Um, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to it. I mean, I, I think you bring up a good point that the board is the policy-setting entity of the state. The board is made up of various state agencies that have some jurisdiction in this this issue, and I think it's important for the entity that represents the state's position on all of these things to be on record and what better place to do it than the, the master plan so i'm not opposed to it i would um encourage a, a public comment suggesting that public comment well you can so you as a board member or if you, if you want to pass a motion for the for the staff to do that that that's that's fine. I, I I don't know the right way to skin the cat, but I think that the, whatever way we can do it, and I, and if I need to make a motion to suggest that, I would I would I would offer that motion right now. I'm looking for for legal. No, so no, You're staying low. No, what? Um, hmm. 
motion to consider. How about okay? So I'm getting legal advice is that we will. How about we'll craft a resolution, um, right, creating cool. the policy of the board, and we can even do that similar to the risk rating 2.0, which will be folded into the master plan. How about that? Okay. I mean, okay. it just goes towards. You know, one of the things that was brought up at the Coastal um, Advisory Governors Coastal Advisory Committee was we 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 got a long funding plan and we need long funding. You know, some of the restore stuff's going to dry out before the end of this plan, and we need to be ready for that. But th next. this this is a perfect example of what needs to be vetted through that advisory commission. And so, risk rating 2.0, revenue sharing, all of those things need to be vetted through that commission to be kicked around vetted and then it's presented to the CPRI board for for approval and I believe that there is a commission meeting Charles before the next um, April. Yeah. before the April CPRI board meeting where we will approve the plan so why don't we do that so let's let's um, we'll work on a resolution to be brought back either at a future board meeting between now and, and final approval of the plan on revenue sharing as well as risk rating 2.0 and then the, that way the board will be on record and the resolutions can uh, formally request that the the position of the board be included in the master plan Roger. is that good thank you peterson okay thumbs up from the back all right thumbs up from peterson is not easy <laughs> <laughs> all right uh miss go no, like. um Dwayne, very much those are items that the commission is discussing and wants to move forward with it. So we'll look forward to working with staff and maybe setting up some other subcommittees of the commission and taking into account what the finance, the finance committee of the CPRA has done and kind of building on that to come to develop those issues further. So thank you. Okay, very good. You just heard it from the chairman herself, Dwayne. So, all right, let's see here. Where are we? Federal Congressional Update, Neil. The board is clear. All right. Great, thank you. Appreciate you keeping us informed of all of the various activities. All right, so let's get into some public comments. I've got one comment card here from Mr. Dean Wilson, who wants to make a public comment about the Atchafalaya Basin. Hello, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Dean Wilson, and uh, the executive director of Atchafalaya Basin Keeper. Um, Atchafalaya Basin Keeper have over 1,700 members. Uh, we part of the Atchafalaya Basin Coalition, which includes commercial fishermen, uh, Sierra Club, and Healthy Golf. So, I'm going to start by saying, by, by asking if you understand the importance of the Atchafalaya Basin to protect us from flooding. You know, we cannot safely survive in South Central Louisiana without the Morganza Spillway. Its sea level is rising. We get more and more floods all the time. As time passes by, you know, the basin will be more and more important for flood protection. When they build the Chafalaya Basin levees, they put them like 80 miles apart on average. The reason is because they need flood capacity. You have to move a huge flood from Sinsport up the Baton Rouge all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. The Atchafalaya Basin protects communities from Baton Rouge all the way to New Orleans, including the port, the largest port in the Western Hemisphere, the port of Southern Louisiana, and all the chemical plants and refineries along the Mississippi River. Now, um, there's a congressional mandate um, that passed in the early 70s, mandated agencies to manage the Atchafalaya Basin for protection and water quality. So I'm here to strongly complain about projects that, that happened in the past and about to happen in the Chafalaya Basin. We call them what they call water quality projects are nothing but sediment diversions that build land within the levee systems in the Chafalaya Basin. By doing that, you're losing flood capacity. You're really putting a nail in the coffin for our kids and grandkids by doing that. How we know it's going to fill wetlands, and I'm talking in particular about the East Grand Lake project, because we see that over and over again. Many of the cuts that they're going to do in the East Grand Lake project, they were already there in the past. And you look at the LIDAR and the elevations that they created, you can see how much land is built in those areas. That's not the coast. We're talking about far away from the coast. 
We're talking about the most productive swamps in the entire world. We're talking about the wetlands that will sustain the migratory birds that come to, from South America into North America when our coast is gone in the future. Um, and not only that, we, this is a series of projects supported by oil and gas and big corporations that benefit by filling wetlands away from the coast, like the Buffalo Coast Project and the Bow Bayou Project. We see that over and over again. The Buffalo Coast Project is supposed to be, oh, let's try and see what happens. If we got accretion greater than an inch, 200 yards away from the cuts, we alter or, or stop the project. You can measure the, the siltation, the sedimentation in feet. Some places, eight feet. I can take you there. It's got crawfish traps, four foot tra traps, only them are sticking out of the mud in one season. They did the bug, and they never, they never stop. Even though they're supposed to stop or alter the project, they keep doing element after element after element. Um, Bobayo project is supposed to, again, the same thing. Let's try to see what happened. They're supposed to monitor how much sand when we move into the area. There was part of the permit was for the, this Paris that did the project to monitor it. Nobody monitored anything. So huge amounts of swamps are gone. Now we're talking about the Israeli project. And I'm going to officially ask you for some time to do a presentation about this project because you follow the money. The science that's been created to support these projects has been, you know, altered and falsified. And if I can show you the pictures of how they're doing it, it is outrageous. And if you follow the money, you, you, your contract with an entity to do the science that is paid by the special interest groups that wants to fill the wetlands, you know, and that's the situation we have today. So I'm officially asking you guys to please allow me to come here and do a presentation to show you the facts related to this project. You have any questions? I would like to answer them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson. So I know you've been in front of the board before, so you know the policy that we don't respond to public comments. But I would encourage you to uh, visit with us after if you'd like to come make a presentation at a future board meeting. I'm not opposed to that. Um, but we don't allow for members to ask questions for for public comments or to respond to public comments. Okay. So let's just take the, your request offline, and we'll try to work you in on a future agenda. Okay. Thank you. And I tried that before, and they talk, they told me, you all told me that I will be able to, and then it was denied. So I just want well, to that's because knows that it was denied. I'm going to stand by my policy, but I'll take it offline. So thank you, Mr. Wilson, for being here today. Uh, any other public comments? <clears throat> all right. A good meeting today, members. I preach everybody, appreciate everybody's time and attention. And uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? A motion by Mr. Burke, second by Ms. Gorman. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Have a great afternoon.